Welcome. Today is Thursday, January 26th, and this is the Arlington um, School Committee. I'd like to welcome um, Juliana Keyes, who is our AEA rep, and Laura Kirshner, who's our student rep from Council. Um, before we get started with public participation, I also want to make an additional announcement. Um, the School Committee has an opening on the Human Rights Commission. Uh, as I understand it, they, there was an opening a few months ago that there are uh, additional applications that they, they see. so they had two openings and they received nine applications. So we will be reviewing the remaining of those applications, but we also encourage if anybody else is interested to send us applications, uh, to send it to Karen Fitzgerald. Uh, we're looking for a brief letter and a resume. Um, and so that is to, um, from our Lisa Briquette uh, is stepping down. Uh, public participation, do we have? No? Okay. Okay, so uh, next item on the agenda is the Arlington High School trip approval to Barcelona, Madrid. Um, is Ms. Bissette? Tentative dates are um, April 12th to 23rd. Uh, it's Megan Bassett, who Megan, Megan Bassett, te yeah. teaches Spanish at the high school. Mm -hmm. and, and Megan, you can introduce. Um, yeah. This is Maria Revolo, and um, we're both Spanish teachers at the high school. Uh, for the past few months, we have been trying to set up and connect with the school uh, to start a Spanish exchange. Um, and we finally were matched with the school just a couple of weeks ago. Um, it's a small beach town just outside of Barcelona. <coughs> so we are hoping to travel over April vacation in 2018. Uh, the students would need to miss two days of school in order to make this trip possible, but uh, we feel like it's a really worthwhile experience for them. Um, in the Spanish department, we've been working on a proficiency model where students are um, really encouraged to speak the language and use it um, in everyday life. And so we think this is an amazing opportunity for them to travel to another country um, and experience Spanish life. Um, since it's an exchange, the 25 students um, from Barcelona would also be coming to visit us uh, and shadow students at the high school uh, in September of 2017. Um, and then after we finish in Barcelona, we thought we would uh, take the students to the capital of Madrid um, just so they can experience a different type of Spanish life um, and see the capital city while they're there. Great. Uh, questions, comments? Mr. Hainer. I guess the first question is for Dr. Bodie. When we have the exchange students here, do we quarry the, the, the parents of the homes? Uh, no, we do not. Okay, so then the reverse thing, I wouldn't, okay, thank you. Are there questions, comments? Nope. Yes, uh, Dr. Alice Nappy. This is actually, a qu I, I think the trip sounds really interesting. The question's more for us. Mm -hmm. I had thought that we had decided to put trips in the consent agenda, mm. and I'm just wondering why we've been pulling them out, and not, not to say it's wrong, I'm just trying to understand why the difference. We, have been, we will put trips in the consent agenda, but when it is a new trip, we, we've asked the people who are organizing the trip to come and present to you. You can take it out of consent agenda tonight and vote it while they're here. Um, now, May, uh, Megan has taken a group of students to Spain, but that was, what, 2000? I, th I think it was in about 2009. 2009, it was a while ago. So, so this sort of qualify as a new trip because it's been a while since we've offered it. And, and, mm -hmm. and you'll find that. If, if it's in the consent agenda, there's no presentation, it's because we've um, had a previous trip, for example, the student council trip. It's a good example of that. Okay. Yes, Dr. One other question. So something that came up with budget and policy is how we're handling the money for these trips and the yes. account size. And mm -hmm. I think this is probably too soon to be thinking about it, but um, whether we can have people pay direct, you know, the it would be preferable if people can pay the companies directly as opposed to us acting as a go-between. So I don't know what what's yeah. happening with that. Yeah, Dr. Wayne. Um, this is something that was brought up at budget and with regard to student activity fees. Um, I think over the next few months we'll be working with um, Rich Fiskay, who is our controller and our high school principal and, and the budget subcommittee to talk about 
how this is going to go forward. But you know, certainly this is on. To, when it's possible to do that, I think that's the preferable way to do it. But I don't know in this specific case whether it will be. That's something that we can we can talk about. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hainer. Just minor correction: it is policy, not budget, that's dealing with this. Oh, it's policy. Yeah. Sorry, Mr. But Hainer. The the other <laughs> part, I, I guess, going forward, I going forward, not this. Did we ask those people doing these programs that that has to be a, a criteria? Uh, to have the, the travel agent. I mean, if there's no travel agent to do it, but... Well, know, we, we, did, mm -hmm. we didn't formally decide that yet. I'm, I think yeah, we were I'm asking a consideration. I'm not asking mm -hmm. for a formal thing. Okay. Thank Dr. Allison Ampey. And I would disagree with Mr. Hainer. I think we should have a discussion. I would hate to have trips not happen. Absolutely. For you folks, what's going on is there's <laughs> a cap on how much money we can hold in a student activity account, and some of these trips end up needing more than that. Mm -hmm. And so we're trying to understand how we can do things the most fiscally responsible. And the easiest thing is just to outsource it and have people right. pay directly. Everything um, for this trip will be going directly through a company. So there we um, go. We will not have any money coming into the school. Right. Thank you. Um, problem. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I just have a question, and perhaps it's for you, and perhaps it's for Dr. Bodhi. Um, the AHS International Scholarship Fund that will fund um, will that fund a complete a student for for the full amount, for half the amount? What is what are we anticipating? Well, I can't answer that right now. Okay. So um, we, but we certainly have. Um, I have a commitment, and I know Dr. Janger also would like to find as much scholarship money as possible, so that's students who couldn't afford these trips would be able to go. Um, I suspect that the scholarships will be in the form of partial scholarships because what our hope is is that students who want to, who know well in advance that a trip is going to happen um, begin some kind of savings plan on their own to, to contribute to it. I, I, I suspect that we probably will not have any full scholarships. And uh, just ask that you publicize that so everyone knows that that's an availability. Yeah. We will. Great. Um, any more questions, comments? We're going to hold, on the, hold on to the motion until the consent agenda. Um, I not think in that's, the consent agenda. What? It, it's in the consent. No, no that's, that's a different not. trip. Oh, that's a no. different trip. Oh, so we should vote on it then. Yes. Okay, so a motion. Move, move to approve the by trip. Mr. Hainer, second. second by Mr. Schuchman. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Great. Thank, thank you very much. Sounds like a great opportunity. Thank you. Fun. Beach Town near Barcelona. That doesn't okay. sound too bad. I know. I've never been to Barcelona. That beach Town, yeah. <laughs> uh, next on the agenda, we have the Arlington High School Program of Studies. <laughs> and just introduce yourselves. Good evening, everyone. I'm Bill McCarthy. I'm the assistant principal at Arlington High School. And I'm Matthew Janger. I'm the principal at Arlington High School. Um, credit where credit is due, the beauty and structure and organization of this presentation and the program of studies is 98.7% Bill McCarthy, so I will let him take the lead in terms of organizing this. I'm here as moral support. Okay. And if we're give, giving credit, the reason it does look so formal is Ms. Broughton, my secretary, <laughs> uh, <laughs> was very good at organizing everything for me. Um, so every year we come before the school committee to ask for approval of the program of studies. I believe everyone has received a copy of the updates in addition to the program of studies itself. Uh, I figured we would go over um, the major changes, and if there were any questions, we could handle them as I go through them. Uh, the second page, if you go through that, is actually just a listing of the new courses. I'll talk about those in a moment because there are several we're very excited about. Uh, on the first page, we do have um, <coughs> physical education graduation requirement. As you all know, um, next year, the graduating class next year will have to have taken three years of PE, whereas all years after that, which would be the <coughs> sophomores, freshmen, and rising ninth graders, for next year, we'll be taking four years of PE. Um, the way we have worked that out will be that ninth graders take a ninth grade PE class, 10th graders <coughs> will take two quarter electives, mm -hmm. and then before graduation, 
they will need to take two more quarter electives, usually one their junior year and one their senior year. Sometimes they will change that up based upon what's available and what courses we offer. Um, yeah, still PE? All right. questions. Any questions on the PE requirements? I have a question, actually. So right now, the current 10th graders are not taking quarter classes. They're taking a full year, or what is? The current 10th grade class is taking one full year of 10th grade PE. Okay, that's what I thought. Okay. And then they will actually have to take one quarter elective junior year, one quarter elective senior year. Got it. The ninth graders next year will take one two quarter electives as mm -hmm. opposed to the full year, and then one quarter elective junior year and one quarter elective senior year. Okay, great, thanks. So the state has a four year, the, the state law is sort of odd because what it says is we have to have a four year requirement. Mm -hmm. um, our past pro process has been a full year, freshman year, full year, sophomore year, and then one quarter elective after, so we didn't actually fulfill that requirement. The challenge we had was to figure out a way that we weren't constraining the kids' opportunities to take other classes, mm -hmm. as well as meeting that requirement. And actually, the PE department came back with the proposal to do it this way, mm -hmm. that by going to after freshman year quarter requirements for everything, mm -hmm. they really were able to have classes. Those are the classes the kids like to take. Those are the classes right. the teachers yeah. like to teach. Um, there's a lot more choice and a lot more variety available. Um, the other thing is that the way we teach PE right now is it's two days a week out of a four-day schedule, which allows students in freshman year to have freshman seminar. We wanted for special ed, for student support, and for other reasons to allow sophomores to still have that for at least a quarter. Mm -hmm. um, but we didn't want to stop up everything else. And you'll see, actually, there's been a push. We've been trying to have more of the electives be half-year electives mm -hmm. to allow students to be able to start taking them earlier and get more variety in their schedule. Um, this provides another opportunity for students to do that, so there are more of those being proposed over time. Right. Also, sorry, I think yeah. Dr. Alice Nampi asked that. Yeah, question. I just wanted to, so it sounds like it's what I was thinking, that they'll be able to have an elective and then PE being, you know, like half-year elective Correct. and the PE being the other, so they'll get to take at least like one and a half electives instead of one. Yes, right. the goal behind this is that they'll be able to take more electives sooner. Yeah. Um, if you actually go through the program of studies and, and some of these items I've updated in here, some of our electives that have been well situated for multiple years, which were open to juniors and seniors, we've now opened up to sophomores. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Great. Okay. Uh, the following th four pieces are items, um, I'll go through each one, but they've been added to the program of studies. One is the learning center, which mm -hmm. is a tutoring center we have open from 9 a.m. until 3.30 p.m. after school. Um, there are two retired teachers who actually run it. They split the job. And our National Honor Society students go in and tutor students throughout the day and after school. Uh, the program has existed for, I believe it's in its second, uh, this will be its third year. So this is just a description of what we offer to students so that they are more aware of it. Students can be scheduled in there. They can also drop in for support services. Uh, the substance abuse services. We have added a line in there about our Jive Turkeys program, which is something we've done years ago, which we're bringing back. Mm -hmm. It's a student support group where students can discuss issues and stress stressors that they are feeling around alcohol and drugs. Uh, that's run by our social workers in the building, and it's a free forum for anyone to join. Uh, the other two pieces are, we originally had a program called the Transition Program, which was to aid students transitioning from hospitalization or into the building. We've since split that into two programs. Mm -hmm. One is the short stop program, which is designed for students that will be, need a short amount of time, a uh, short amount of assistance, transitioning back into the high school if they've been hospitalized for an extended period of time for illness um, or other means. And the other program is the Harbor program, which is a program designed to help our students that have uh, chronic mental health and medical issues that will be ongoing for a year or two years to help them get in the building, receive curriculum, and make acceptable progress. Uh, Mr. Hainer, sorry. Are either of these programs, or is it a different program, what used to be called the Millbrook program? The Millbrook program is a separate program from these two. Okay. The Millbrook it, program it, it is a... It sounded similar. Right. The, the Millbrook program is a transition and evaluation program for right. students 
in a number of different conditions, but that's only a 40 to 45 day program. Oh. Um, so this is for students with com chronic complex medical and mental health issues might, that require ongoing support. Might it, a student that's gone through the Millbrook end up in one of these as well? It could happen. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Um, the next page actually lists our new courses for next year. Um, you'll notice we've divided it up by department. There's a wide array of new courses being offered next year. Um, I don't know if anybody has any questions about specific ones, which I'd be happy to answer. Okay, um, Mr. Slickman. I know this is a point where you're putting out offerings to see what the student response would be. Yes. <clears throat> and that you'll make your decision on courses based that, that are actually going to run based on the student response. So I, re you know, I understand, I realize this is a preliminary, uh, too preliminary to really ask the question, but I'm wondering if there's things that are by nature going away from the course catalog that you would have been running before. Uh, well, several of the courses that are listing here are actually renaming uh, mm -hmm. courses that currently exist, but mm -hmm. they've decided to change the curriculum, and they've changed courses to reflect that. For example, under music, the courses listed there currently exist under what is called music technology. They've decided to take a more focused program. So these courses already exist, they're mm -hmm. just changing curriculum. In regards to courses that are no longer running, uh, on the last page, um, we will be removing presentational speaking. Mm -hmm. Public policy will be suspended for one year. We're mm -hmm. trying to get that on a um, biannual mm -hmm. system to boost interest. Uh, symposium has been replaced with a new title. Uh, sophomore English also has a new title. And Rock Band has a new title as mm -hmm. well. Um, and as you said, ideally we run these new courses um, we put them out there so that students can request them. Mm -hmm. And then based upon our staffing ability and the demands of the courses, we will shift courses as needed. Uh, if a course does not receive a required amount to be considered full, mm -hmm. then unfortunately it does not run. We meet with those students and we move them to other classes. Mm -hmm. so, so this is really a revenue neutral um, operation to add the courses. We're not, it, it, by, by definition at this point, adding more sections or incurring more expenses? We are not incurring more expenses. I will say that we are requesting additional staffing just because of expansion of our student population mm -hmm. and the constraints already on our core classes. But this does not, this is separate from that. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Steele. That was my question. That was thank your you. question, okay. Uh, sorry, Mr. Hainer. The early childhood uh, for the seniors Mm -hmm. At the end, it says they're not eligible for the certification. Is it because it's only a uh, partial? You have to do so many hours or so many years? Yes, the state requires four years. Um, the course that we are newly offering, we actually piloted this year. It's for students that could not complete all four years, but they still want to get the experience of working in a preschool or a daycare. It's a, an internship program. We were having to tell students that they couldn't participate in the internship program if they did not take all four years. This opens that to them. So, and what exactly does the certification, the student that does it for four years, uh, they're allowed to work in a daycare center or something? Is that the, with? Fortunately, the department head, okay. <laughs> <laughs> the lead teacher is here. And she, she seems can, to be shaking her head. Do you wanna, um, do you wanna come up to the microphone and? Currently, our early childhood education program, if students take, okay, thank you. Um, if students participate in all four years, they have enough content and contact hours to be able to apply to the state Massachusetts office of, I always get them mixed up, uh, child care and education, early child care and education. And they are, allowed, they are able to apply for that certification, which would allow them to work in a preschool or daycare setting. Um, we love that program yeah. because it gives them a little upper edge and I'll talk about it more in my right. presentation but without that practicum year they won't have enough contact hours to be able to apply for that certification thank you yeah thanks thank you. Uh, dr. Allison Effie. Um I was wondering if you could explain the difference between the current English um, 10th grade class and the new one that's coming of course. Um, so the original title for the 10th grade English class um, 
I should know the name of it. And I'm it it's on literary it right heritage. Now. Thank you. Thank you very much. I used to teach it. I should know it. Um, so they've decided to revamp the curriculum, offering new titles, and to change the title to Examining Expression. Um, I believe, from my understanding, uh, Ms. Perry, the department head for English, gave me a, a brief rundown on it. It was more focusing on different authors and bringing in more of a concept around um, literary expression and students learning the art of expression in their writing. Okay. okay. I have a quick question about the senior project that the course no, no longer offered. Um, what, what was that, or is that sort of a capstone project? Uh, senior project worked as a capstone project. Mm -hmm. uh, for a while, it was quite popular. We actually had, uh, at its height, 40 or 50 students involved, and they would intern throughout the town. Uh, we have since evolved that to the academic internship program, mm -hmm. where students are, for the first semester, <coughs> uh, the first few weeks, they are trained uh, here on how to be business professional and they are placed in various offices throughout the town. Mm -hmm. um, so it was the natural evolution of Senior Project, mm -hmm. and now Senior Project is no longer necessary. Got it. Okay, great, thanks. Any other questions, comments? Do you want to? A motion. No, not yet, right? Do, we want, do you want to present anything about the current? I mean, you've talked about the new courses, but is there anything to say about the, the other document that we have? Just the, the program of studies. Yeah, it's program of studies. Okay. The other one is the complete program of studies, so, as it will appear online. Nothing. Okay. Okay. So, Mr. Thelman. So I move that we uh, accept the uh, revised program of studies for FY18. Okay. Second. Seconded by Mr. Hayner. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Unanimous. Thank Great. you. Thank you Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. And I hope to invite you uh, back to talk about the internship program at some point this year. Okay. Um, family and consumer sciences update. And well, please introduce yourself, or do you wanna? I, I can. Uh, this is uh, Trisha Bellarosi, and she is the lead teacher for family and consumer science at grades six through 12. Mm -hmm. Thank you for having me. Thanks. So I'd like to give you a brief overview of family and consumer sciences and what we have to offer in the town of Arlington, as well as what we currently offer and what our vision for the future holds. Mm -hmm. I guess I don't know which bus button to push. Okay. So in facts classes, students learn skills and obtain information that assists individuals, families, and communities to make informed decisions about their well-being, relationships, and resources to achieve optimal quality of life. This is taken directly from the American Association of Family and Consumer Sciences mission statement, which we try our hardest to live up to. Um, family and consumer sciences professionals all over the world um, are dedicated to this mission. I am often asked about what exactly is family and consumer science. They'll say, you know, you teach what? What is that? Um, it is true, our former name was Home Economics, but in 1994, the American Association of Family and Consumer Sciences voted to change the name to Family and Consumer <laughs> Sciences and hope that it would be a better descriptive of what we do. Um, these are content areas that are defined by the American Association of Family and Consumer Sciences and their national standards. And um, many people don't realize that our field actually was born right here in Massachusetts at MIT. Um, our founder was the first graduate and professor um, at MIT, female professor. And she was an advocate for consumer education um, child protection, nutrition, and application of the science of doing things to care for home family community. She really strived to help people understand not only how we do things properly, but why we do them properly, the science of it, and that's where the science comes in. 
so you can see that if you look at the FACTS umbrella, we address everything from career skills, healthy family, community connections, consumer and family resource management, financial education, consumer services, education, early childhood, human development, um, as well as interpersonal skills. We also get into health as well as um, community services, hospitality and tourism, housing and interior design, textiles, and uh, facilities management and maintenance. So we have a lot of areas in our umbrella. So in Arlington, Family and Consumer Sciences teaches students the connection between setting, making a good decision, setting a goal, the process of getting to that goal, that goal achieved, and then learning those skills so that they can have a better quality of life. By doing this, it's our hope that they'll make healthy decisions and have a, a more, uh, a better quality of life for both themselves, their families, the community, their work. We teach independence, self-reliance, and resiliency. We offer students a lot of hands-on, self-directed, and personalized learning. It is not uncommon for students to have a choice in how they show us what they've learned and how they show us the skills and that decision-making process and the goal setting. Um, they are allowed to express creativity. They're constantly collaborating and problem solving. Family and Consumer Sciences helps students make connections between their core academics and the real world and how they relate. In some ways, we're constantly looking at them and saying, well, this is why you're learning this in math and this is why you're learning this in science and look, here's the connection here. And uh, it, it is real fun to see that light bulb go off when they make those connections. Um, to practice career skills and the correlation between school, home, and work expectations. Um, at the high school, as a department, we developed a rubric for their daily grade, and we called it their professionalism grade. And we have an activity that we do with them at the beginning of the term that helps them make that connection. So if you had your cell phone out while you were at work and you were supposed to be completing this task, how could that affect your work? Well, we're asking you while, you have your, while you're working in here to keep that cell phone away as well because we want you to practice that because it could have you know, uh, severe consequences in the world of work. And we do that also with you know, participation. Um, we have them think about if their technology is out, not just the cell phones, but if they have their iPad or their computer out when it shouldn't be. What could the consequence be? Uh, we have them practicing real world skills through labs, scenarios, and simulations. We're constantly giving them scenarios that are true to life. Uh, we are having them participate in simulations that help them understand how that skill is used. And so, for example, uh, we might put a whole group of ingredients out on the table. Well, in a lot of ways, that is similar to when you open up your refrigerator at night to see what you have for ingredients and they create a healthy meal or they create a dish that goes along with the unit of study. Uh, we often will give them a budget amount and take them over to Stop and Shop and they shop for ingredients within that budget along with the unit. We also have them do financial scenarios at the eighth grade level where they talk about where they learn about money management and those scenarios where they are given a certain amount and they need to pay their essential and their non-essential expenses, where are you gonna make those choices? We give them opportunities to explore STEAM, science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics, as it relates to multiple facets in life and career paths. We encourage them to explore careers within all of our areas and we also offer practical experiences and internships at the high school level. We are driven by both national and state standards. Our state standards for Massachusetts are the comprehensive health standards. That is our main area. But then we also expand upon those. 
by going to national standards as well as other Massachusetts and national standards depending on what the unit of study is. So for example, Massachusetts Comprehensive Health Standards has a consumerism health, a consumer health section. We didn't just stay at that. We also went to the national personal finance standards to make sure that they were getting skills that they needed. We focus on healthy foods, for example, in our culinary, but we went beyond that and we went to the Massachusetts Vocational Technical Education Standards as well as the National Family and Consumer Science Standards so that we could ensure that they would graduate not only with skills for their health, but skills that would give them an upper edge when they go to apply for jobs, possibly after high school or even in high school while they're trying to pursue education and training. So some facts about family and consumer sciences in Arlington. At Audison, we have 2.6 FTE. At Arlington High School, we have 2.4. We are all certified in both family and consumer sciences and health. Massachusetts has combined those two certifications. That is the same certification now. Um, Audison students participate in facts classes for one quarter. The sixth grade stays with their teacher. Um, for the full quarter, 7th and 8th grade, they switch due to facilities. We want all students to have the opportunity to be able to get some practice in the kitchen. And uh, we aren't able to do that uh, in just one room for the whole term, so we switch them and we give them a different experience. Um, at the Audison, we are strong, well, actually in both Audison, at the Audison and the high school, we are really working hard to help support the district goals of the social emotional health, um, as well as teaching practical life skills. That's something that we work hard on. Um, at the high school, we offer elective opportunities. One of our courses, the interior and fashion design, meets the fine arts requirement. One course um, offers enough content and contact hours to receive certification with the Massachusetts Office for Early Child Care and Development. And we have we're been working hard to try and build some district and community partnerships. We, for our early childhood program, we have partnered with Monotomy Preschool and Daycare. And we have recently connected with Whole Foods Market so that students can experience and see um, what food preparation out in um, food service looks like. We're gonna be going there for a pizza demonstration next week. So the students are quite excited about that. And then again, practical experiences and internships. This is a snapshot of our sixth grade curriculum. Uh, we took over the Great Body Shop curriculum back in 1998 when the sixth grade came over to the Audison. And we, <clears throat> Just recently, I'd say within the last couple years, have gotten, we've moved from the sixth grade curriculum to the middle school level one curriculum. Um, as you can see, this curriculum includes a broad range of health skills. It includes decision making, goal setting and planning, nutrition, a maturation unit, um, social emotional health, including prevention, recognizing and managing stress. We've uh, expanded that unit. Uh, based on the Youth Risk Behavior Survey results. Uh, resiliency skills, we're always uh, trying to prevent diseases and uh, safety is a big thing with the middle school students. We are also uh, working with a substance abuse prevention. We've expanded our unit on that and uh, bullying prevention. We also provide enrichment to these programs. So for example, when we were teaching decision making and um, substance abuse, we realized that the students absolutely know the right decision to make. Where they were having a difficult time was being able to get out of the situation and save face to their friends. And so we um, took a book by Sharon Stone called How to Say No and Keep Your Friends and we developed a refusal skills unit that we teach with the decision making so that students have those skills and they feel more confident in being able to get out of those situations. Uh, we also instituted a unit 
We expanded upon it from the disease illness prevention unit um, on the importance of sleep because in, because in the youth risk behavior survey, we saw that students were not getting the sleep that they needed. And so we started working on that. A breakfast, we saw a lot of students weren't eating breakfast. So with the, six, with the middle school curriculum, as well as the high school curriculum, we really look at all of our data to make sure and ensure that we're meeting the needs of the student and the community. In seventh grade, we split by quarter. Um, they spend one half of the quarter in the foods lab learning about kitchen safety, food safety, healthy food preparation, and they also explore um, food diversity from a global perspective. And then for the other half of the quarter, they work on marketing, advertising, comparison shopping, and consumer skills. And so the students take a good look at marketing ploys. They take a good look at strategies that advertisers use to try and pull them in. And uh, they actually create advertisements by going into the TV. Well, at one point, they were going into the TV studio. And I think we may have visited you with a video of that. And uh, now they're doing it with the iPads and the technology. In eighth grade, the curriculum for the foods and nutrition is similar, but we also cover eating disorders and healthy eating. And then they get a unit on financial literacy and career exploration. So they talk about money management, management banking, being fiscally, financially responsible. They participate in a lot of financial education scenarios. Um, and we do a simulation with them where they're paying bills using beans. And they have to figure out how to make those beans last by paying all of those bills and making choices. And the thing that's interesting about that is they actually complete a survey before about what they envision their life to be. And so they start to try and pay the bills with that. And then they realize that they've got to make some changes and that we have a talk about how, you know, um, meeting your financial goals doesn't come instantly. It takes a lot of work and planning, goal setting. And that also there's a direct correlation between education and socioeconomic levels. And so we explore that. And then we talk about career exploration. They take a look at the program of studies for the high school and college requirements. At the high school, um, we have three main areas within our, our umbrella that we take a look at. Early childhood education, interior and fashion design, and culinary arts and hospitality. We do provide them with career information and skills in all of these areas. They practice a lot of soft skills, so communication, collaboration. Um, they also learn healthy living skills. They explore art culinary and fashion from a STEAM perspective, a design process. Um, we had a guest speaker from the School of Design in Boston, and he came in and you would have thought that he was reading off the wall of the engineering and tech program over at the Audison. And uh, so they really go through that whole design process and they make those connections between engineering and design <coughs> and design within interior and fashion as well as culinary. They do a lot of recipe development and test kitchens. Uh, the transition from school to independent living, um, understanding human development, and early childhood education curriculum planning and teaching skills. Our early childhood education program is a four-year program. If they complete all four years, they have enough contact hours and content to be able to, uh, we spoke about it earlier, to be able to apply for certification. They, it is very personalized, and they have a lot of hands-on observation as well as interaction with the students in the preschool and daycare. Um, they do a lot of simulations, journal reflections, and things like that. There are five classes within that. They all are very um, structured. And, not structured, I apologize. They're scaffold um, and build up to that fourth year internship. As Mr. McCarthy was talking about, uh, we did pilot this year. We had a student who was not able to participate in the practicum class and desperately wanted to complete an internship. She was very dedicated in her first two years. And so we have been uh, 
piloting a hybrid of the practicum and internship. She goes out to the elementary schools, but she also gets a lot of the content from the practicum. So it's a hybrid of it. She understands that she won't have enough contact hours uh, to apply for the certification. Our interior and fashion design program fulfills the fine arts requirement. Again, we look at the design process from the perspective of homes and fashion. And this is very personalized, very hands-on, many guest speakers. I know that at one point they did a walking tour of Arlington looking at different styles of homes. Um, they are looking at different types of fabrics and we were lucky enough to be sponsored by the Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandising to have a fashion club. Our culinary arts and hospitality class uh, we have both full year course offerings and semester offerings. The semester courses did not run this year, but those students moved into the culinary two and three class that we have. We are going to keep it in the program of studies because with the new PE requirement, we feel like it would be great for them to be able to have the opportunity to experience some culinary. It's a very popular program. It is definitely our largest program. Um, we do a lot to explore the connection between science and food prep and food and health and nutrition. Uh, we explore community resources. We practice meeting and budget. The upper level courses have more of a career and a global focus. We're in Italy on our culinary tour right now. Um, the kids love pasta. They were very excited about <laughs> this. Um, and they really take a closer look at skills and what would be needed if they were going to work in the industry for those who are interested in it but also for those who may be working in it as a job when they're pursuing their education so our vision for the future um, exciting news we applied for a grant with the attorney general's office for opioid prevention to purchase and provide training in the botvin life skills training curriculum uh, with uh, Julie Dunn as well. We would like to continue increasing the simulations in all of our courses. We'd like to increase the number of semester facts classes at the high school level. Um, we'd like to expand culinary and interior and fashion, but there are also other classes that we would be interested in offering. So for example, uh, there was a class that had been proposed before, College Survival Skills One Step Ahead, which is a course that addresses all kinds of different areas from finances to um, healthy cooking on a budget. Uh, we would also like to conduct some student interest surveys so that we can provide students with things that they are interested in learning more about. We'd like to continue building more community connections incorporate more professional culinary skills, for example, providing students with an opportunity to participate in the online Serve Safe program, which uh, would give them an upper edge in the workplace if they were applying for a job. And we would like to continue to collaborate with the Young Adult Living Seminar and other programs at Arlington High School and Audison to help meet the needs of all of our students. Um, I'd like to thank you for having me and for your support that you provide our program with. Um, it really is very progressive. Just the other day, there was an article out of the Canadian Broadcast Center um, where the New Brunswick Medical Society um, actually put recommendations out for their um, citizens of New Brunswick, and their number one recommendation um, that they went to the province and asked for was that home economics be mandatory in their schools because of all of the umbrella that we do offer. And so that, in my opinion, makes us very progressive that we have such a strong department in our school system and we're excited about what we can do for our youth and community in terms of helping them have a better quality of life. Thanks. Are there any questions? Uh, yes, questions, comments, Mr. Hainer. Uh, the internship at the elementary schools, is that just done at the primary grades? Yes, yes. The students make the connections with teachers that they're interested in working with. Typically, uh, we find that they're teachers that they just loved being in their classes and would like to spend time um, in a different capacity. Can you just give a brief capsule of what the student is expected to do? They keep a journal or? Yes. Um, the students go to their teacher's class, Ms. Craigie. They sign out. 
and they go to the elementary schools. Their roles at the elementary school really are different for all of the students. They all have different experiences based on what their cooperating teacher is interested in having them do. Um, I've heard of them, you know, running and helping to, to run a circle time, um, working on projects with them, um, being a class assistant, helping them with the math and reading and things like that. Um, as far as their work for the course itself, they do a lot of reading uh, journals, uh, journal articles, reflection on their experiences, and relating it back to things that they've learned in their content over the years. Do they share with each other? Is yes, the, they do. In a seminar to setting? my knowledge, yes. Oh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Allison Abbey. Um, I just wanted to say I was really impressed how you like identified the refusal skills and the need for that and then addressed it. I think that's Thank really you. helpful for the kids. It is something they need to know how to do. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'll make sure that my team has that relayed to them. Yes, Mr. Slickman. I know that the culinary program has been long time been one of the most popular things that goes on in this building. And uh, the joy that, you, that you've provided to our students as well as I know we've had exchange students that they've gone through the culinary area and just had, had an absolute blast. Um, have you been thinking about what sort of facilities, programmatic facilities you're going to be needing uh, when we go to a newer uh, building? Yes, I, I have. <laughs> um, I have. <laughs> I, ha I have given that some thought, however, I, have, I do not have definitive descriptions. Um, I would like to see, I would like to see more of a hybrid between a professional kitchen and a home kitchen. Uh, we definitely, given the size of the program, would need more than one lab. Uh, secure storage, really, I can't give definitive. I'm sorry. I, no, that's okay. You, you, I, I would that. like to. See, I would like to see um, mm -hmm. facilities that would allow for students to explore multiple areas of the culinary field. Mm -hmm. I would like them to be able to learn how to properly use uh, professional equipment mm -hmm. as well as equipment for in the home. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to see. Um, the restaurant come back to an extent, maybe not to the extent that it was when Ms. Glidden was here, but I would love for the students to be able to share their products maybe with a display case um, for baked goods, um, soups, you know, simple things that they could, the faculty could purchase. That would take, I would need to take a lot more time to think about that, but I do have experience with it. One of my jobs, I ran the faculty cafe at a school that I was at, and we headed down to a system based on their facilities. So I would like to see some sense of that so that students can practice those hospitality skills that we talk about and not just learn about them. Yeah, I understand that this, this is sort of a left field question yeah. from where you are. <laughs> But this is something that we've been thinking about a lot. I mean, uh, right. the, the, the new high school weighs heavily Absolutely. on our mind. And, and, and the more that folks can talk to us about their dreams for a new building and what they need in order to do their job well, uh, be thinking, be planning. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that your input will be highly valued as we move forward. Thank you. Ah, Dr. Jenger. <laughs> well, well I, can't, I can't recognize you. Uh, wait, Dr. Jenger, come to the microphone if you're, if you're going to speak. She undersells the amount of thinking she's done on this. <laughs> we have memos and memos. Um, no <laughs> I don't want to go into it. We'd be here all night. <laughs> Thank Thanks. you. <laughs> Thanks. We'd be happy to expand out your square footage if we can justify the program. Absolutely. Thank you. I appreciate that support. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Mr. Thielen? Uh, first of all, I, I can't remember a, a presentation on family and consumer science. Uh, maybe we've had one, but I've forgotten about it. So thanks so much for doing this. It's very, very yeah, helpful. Thank you for having me. I'm just curious how you got into this. I'm just curious your own background. What, what got you into this field? Um, well, my mom is a home economist. Uh -huh. uh, she taught family and consumer sciences. And when I was in high school, I grew up in northern Maine. 
and I wanted to originally have a program for teen parents. That was the type of thing that I wanted. And when I looked at home economics, it was home economics at the time, I felt like that had every aspect that would need to be covered. Everything from parenting to financial planning to healthy living. And I felt like it would be a perfect program uh, for that. So I went to the University of Maine at Farmington for their home economics program. Um, and I saw that they were closing all of the programs up there and I panicked. So I took some time off and I worked in early childhood for a while. And then I entered into Leslie College's human services program because I felt like that was a wonderful complement to the home economics. So um, I finished in that. I had had all of my course of coursework in education except for my student teaching. And I was fortunate enough to be given a one-year position um, over in Newton uh, in Family and Consumer Sciences. And my love just always went back to teaching versus human services. And I've been very fortunate in my career to work in many different environments. Um, I've worked as the, you know, I mentioned earlier, the st faculty cafe. Um, I actually started my career in Arlington back in 1997. Okay. Um, and I did leave for a while when I had my family due to commute. And I was fortunate enough to come back in 2012. So, Great. I, and I love, what, I love that I get to help students learn these types of skills. I, I love when you can see the light bulb go off when they make the connection between their core subjects and how it relates to their personal life and how it relates to those independent sk living skills. Good stuff. Great. So. Thank, thanks for Thanks a lot. Thanks oh, thank you. To get some background to, and context for the work we did. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so next item on our agenda, we have the school calendar, which we went did our first read last uh, meeting, and um, this is our second read. And just as a reminder, um, not everything is on this calendar, right? So we have, we're working on school committee uh, dates, uh, we have beginning and end, so you can actually fill us in what else do we, what, what, are we, what do we have and what are we missing on the calendar? What you have are the start, end dates, vacation, major holidays, <coughs> um, what you, and school committee meetings, mm -hmm. which you may want to have more discussion about. What you do not have yet are the secondary early release days and conference schedules. And that will be something that you will be able to have. We want to have it to you earlier this year than we've had in the past. Um, the other thing that I talked about last week, we've had some clarification this last week about kindergarten. I think the most important thing to say to parents is that kindergarten will start the first day of school. It will be a different program than it will be um, for the other students. One of the things we have learned over the last week as we've been discussing this and looking at various um, options is that um, in the contract, um, it's, it is mentioned that kindergarten teachers will be able to meet with parents in conferencing prior to uh, the start of school. So we've modified this a little bit, and this is our proposal at this time um, to you. Um, we still probably will have more discussions on this as we go forward, but the important thing is that the um, kindergarten students will start the first week. We do want to make sure that this is completely decided by the start of registration, which is going to be in mid-March. In fact, I can talk about that in a minute. But the plan right now is that we'll have open house on Tuesday, and then on Tuesday and Wednesday, there'll be an opportunity for parents who want to do this to have a, about a 10-minute conference with um, kindergarten teachers. And it'll be signed up just like we do regular conferences. And then on Thursday and Friday, half of the class will meet for the full day. 
I think that what was universal among, not almost universal, uh, among kindergarten teachers, they, they did like the, the having a smaller group go through the whole school day, to learning all of the different um, routines, not to learn then, but they at least go through the routines uh, of a school day. And then the first full school day for all kindergarten students will be the Monday following Labor Day. On the 11th. On uh, the 11th. Dr. Alessandri has a question. Or, oh, or so when you say kindergarten students will start the first day, you mean their week starts, they don't actually have, all of them don't have kindergarten every day that week? They do not. They'll actually be in school uh, either Thursday or Friday that week. Okay, so they... Tuesday, they have an open house. Now, yes, it, could a parent forego the Tuesday, Wednesday? They could, except that if they hadn't done the, the, the screening that we require of all kindergarten students in June, then they would need to have the screening done that week. Okay. I'm just trying to make sure that we communicate to parents because they're going to need child care if their kids aren't in school. That's why this is really important to make sure, as, as kindergarten parents become more aware of registration when it's starting, they're going to want that information. And we want to have it on the, the video that will be on the registration site mm -hmm. and in writing and in emails. Great. <laughs> as many ways as we can communicate it. That does help. Uh, Mr. Hainer? Just for understanding, this is listed as a second read. Mm -hmm. Normally, a second read means we're approving it going right. forward. Yes. We're not approving the total calendar tonight, are we? Or is that what you're asking? I'm just trying we're to understand. We're approving this calendar. To what is it? This is going to stay this, what you've presented tonight. But yes. the, you will be adding other things mm -hmm. going forward. We'll be adding other things. And it, I and don't think we'll be amending anything. But if we did, right. that would come up in the second time with calendar. We've been doing this in parts. OK. Partly because. Mm -hmm rather than wait on the full calendar toward the end of the year, at least I, we can do the ones everybody things we know right now. I just want to be clear date, that we, we're coming along with you in approving parts as we go along. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Um, we were asked the question uh, by email about the school committee dates. Mm -hmm. And, okay, I can't pull up the calendar and talk to you guys at the same time. Um, but when I looked at the calendar, I personally agreed that I would rather have the dates of February 8th, March 1, March 15, March 29, than whatever's on mm -hmm. the calendar right. itself. Okay. And I would like to propose that as a motion. Okay. Wait, do what? Uh, Say so that again, is, please. Okay, so the proposal is um, to have the February 8th meeting, mm -hmm. but not have a meeting on the 1st or the 15th. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To have a meeting on March 1st, 15th, and 29th, but not have a meeting on March 8th and 22nd. Is that right? I'll second that motion. Okay, yes. motion by Dr. Asampi, second by Mr. Schlickman. Uh, let's discussion on the motion. Do, do we want a, an explanation of why this makes sense or why, yes. why the proposal? There's vacation all over the place. That's what's um, Well, one, it's, it creates a, uh, a two week spacing, but more importantly, if we look at what our budget cycle is this year, um, this puts the meetings um, at, a, at a point when closer, it, it just makes the whole budget cycle a little bit tighter. This year we would, we've normally in the last few years anyway, gone to, uh, presented our budget to the finance committees mid to late March. So this gives a little bit more time to get the budget um, in full, fully, fully approved. Okay. Um, so, okay, Mr. Steele. Just to clarify, yeah. so it's, the meetings will be February 8th, 8th March 1st, 1st, March 8th, March 27th. No, 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 no March 1st, 15th, 15, 15, 15, 15, 29. 29. 29th. So three in, in March, one in, in February. Got it. Yes. Uh, Mr. Hainer. I just want to bring to everyone's attention, taking, taking a look at November and December, there's November has back to back and December has back to back. Just yep. so we're aware of yeah. them, no surprises yeah, we, next we year. Yeah, we talked about that last. That's time. fine. Mm -hmm. I just want to. Um, <laughs> uh, do you want to mention something about the budget? Do, I mean, do you want to add anything? No, just that's when I look at. I mm -hmm. I just feel like the that yep. date spacing works better. Okay. Um, and that's why I'm proposing it. Right. Yeah, Mr. Hainer. As a, on this calendar, we're keeping the 21st of June on the calendar, as 
Yes. We usually schedule it. We don't always use the second one. So, mm -hmm. um, so we now need a vote. Right, a vote. Okay. All in favor, please. Uh, say on aye. the amendment. On the amendment to this, is that right? Yes. That, yeah. So, so the amendment was made by Dr. Allison Ampe, seconded Second. by Mr. Schlickman, and the amendment was to change the the February dates. and March yeah. dates to February and March dates to the ones yes. we talked about. The February eighth, March first, March fifteenth, right. March 29th. Right. Yep. Okay. All in favor? Yes. Aye. 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 It's unanimous. Okay. And on the main motion. Um, and on the main motion, we have not had a main motion, so okay. that's. Oh. <laughs> hmm, okay. We'll move approval. <laughs> so we knew. Well, we, well, we amended a motion. We've so amended. We, okay, yeah. so. Uh, um, um, motion to adopt the uh, calendar as uh, amended. amended. Mm -hmm. Second. Okay. Uh, motion by Mr. Schlickman, a second by Mr. Thielman to adopt the calendar as amended. All in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Mm -hmm. Any opposed? Okay. Okay. Um, anything else on calendar? Or is that? I think that's it for right now. That's it for right now. Okay. Um, so, superintendent report. You're super well, early right now. I have a, have a quite a few things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, let me start out with um, well, the school building updates. But this time, I'm going to start with the high school. Mm -hmm. We have, we have now submitted all of the documentation required for Module 1 and have been invited by MSBA to uh, attend the February 15th board meeting for okay. approval to move into the feasibility study. Um, we, part of the, the work of the last couple months has been working very, very collaboratively with MSBA to arrive at a um, an enrollment number that mm -hmm. we both feel meets the the methodology and consistency required by MSBA for building projects as well as meeting the needs of the high school and that number and that design enrollment number is 1755 students I think that there is um, people have been working on this field that this is a, a, a an adequate number um, there will probably be times when we, the number of students in the building might exceed that. But the point is mm -hmm. that this number determines the number of homerooms that would be in the building. It does not determine the number of other educational spaces. And as we were talking about tonight, uh, what kind of space do we need for our family and consumer science mm -hmm. program? And this is the kind of work that's going to be happening in all departments in terms of what uh, what the space requirements are going to be to be needed, and of course, there's a whole a lot of other things we need to take talk a look take a look at when we look at the high school, and um, and of course, one of the big ones is security. Mm -hmm. So uh, th we're so we're not in the feasibility study yet. We are being invited to the February 15th board meeting, and um, I think we're feeling very good about the work we've been doing with MSBA so far. Can I actually ask a question about the modular? So I know that the feasibility study is a modular three, right? Is that right? And then, and mm -hmm. then we have modular one. It's what? It's module. Mo module. So module. module. So yeah, I'm used to say. Um, and then there's a second mm -hmm. module that's sort of a where we partially satisfied, and then which is. A, Yes, yeah, so I could, what we could do at another meeting, if you would like, is do it after we get through February 15th. I think I would prefer to yeah. wait until we go through that milestone, and then we can talk about what's next. That'd be great. All of what, what we're going to be doing. That'd be great. Okay. Just Good. clarification. Mm -hmm. Once that milestone has been met, the timeline is something that you can predict somewhat better. <laughs> Maybe. Okay, I'll wait. Maybe. Thank you. Maybe. Okay. Feasibility studies can have some variance in terms of um, how long they'll take. The, 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 from what I understand, there is really no other time restriction on the other ones. The only one is the first module. You have to complete it within 270 days, and we, we've, exceed, we've completed it Good. quicker than that. Mm -hmm. our, Thank you. I think our date was sometime in March, early March. Great. Mm -hmm. All right, so the other building projects, because we've agreed that every meeting will yes. get a little update. 
The good news is Stratton is just moving along just fine. Um, it's um, on time and moving forward. And I was over there the other day, and it's it's uh, it's really quite remarkable how well they have adopt, uh, adapted to these modular classrooms, and they're just really making it work, and they're doing it with, in good cheer as well. It's quite commendable. Uh, moving with Thompson, Thompson, by the, both by the report of our owner's project manager and the company, uh, we are we are still slated to be able to open in September. Mm -hmm. But we're watching that very carefully as we go forward. Uh, I think one of the um, one of the necessary parts of this will be there'll be some Saturdays that the contractor will need to work. But what I do want to let the neighbors know, and we will, um, is we will, we will make sure that uh, we will send them a letter that will be delivered to their house telling them when those, those days, those Saturdays are required. One was supposed to happen last week, but they were able to complete enough work due to the weather, so that wasn't necessary. So it's, it's good. The uh, Gibbs uh, School, again, is moving forward um, quite quite well in terms of the matching, the, the things that need to be accomplished by the timeline. Again, the intent is that we're ready to really begin renovation on July 1 this year mm -hmm. with opening a school the following September, September 18. Tomorrow, in fact, the architect is here to work with each one of the curriculum leaders to talk about what their requirements are in the building, both in terms of storage and finishes, because um, as I had said to you and in emails to parents, these, we really need to be um, finished with the schematics by the end of January, and so we're getting very close to that. Uh, so for example, um, the architect will be um, talking with family consumer science in every single mm -hmm. department. In fact, these department chairs have already completed um, a fairly um, detailed survey, and then it's just going over these tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So that's moving forward. Uh, so Dr. Alston, I'd be happy. Mm -hmm. Does that include special education? Um, yes. Well, I mean, we have the, I mean, in terms of finishes? I don't, I don't. Just Do you have programmatic needs, is yeah. that the question? Yeah, Does, just are oh. they? Involve. I'm, I'm still concerned about the transition, multiple transitions for these kids who don't handle transitions as well, and just Did anything wanna, this is, that can be that that would be in the planning process. Okay. This is the building, the spaces. Um, Allison Elmer and I had worked on that quite we a bit. The, you should uh, turn your. Thing. We also yeah. shared with the architect um, an outline of when you're talking about finishes, that would make, um, from a universal design perspective, to floor mm -hmm. finishes, to, mm -hmm. you know, things that would dampen sound and mm -hmm. things like that. So we had shared that with the um, architects very early on. Very early on, including, um, um, you can tell me the exact name. Is it, it's an audio, that's the audio wiring that's going to be in sure. the building. So um, hard wiring the red cat system into mm -hmm. the thing. But also we've worked with our teacher, the visually impaired, to get recommendations around how to design a space that would suit people with low vision, visually impaired, things like that. Great. Mm -hmm. So the red cat system is? It's for a sound amplification system. So for students who require it, it's, you know, they need it. But then it's what a side effect that many, um, districts and classrooms have found is that it amplifies noise or sound um, and many students benefit from that. It's right, easier sure. to focus in on the person's voice. Sure. You know, like I think lots of these things many students benefit from. Yeah. yeah. That is what the research has shown and, and I think that um, teachers uh, actually choose this when they can. Yes. Yes. Do we know about bells, or is that too early? That's too early. Okay. Will there be a bell system wiring for all of that? Yes. So we're really right now on this, the physical part of the building. Mm -hmm. and, but there are some things that need to be decided now um, in part of the, the, the whole costing of this is, is if there's built-ins. And one of, the, one of the issues at Gibbs, um, if I had fairly lively discussion about this just this week, and that is technology whether we're going to have carts that are charging carts or that we're going to do built-ins for charging. And then how, you know, we, we do the built-ins, say we did built-ins now, 
will the, the space allocated, if we did built-ins, actually conform to the kind of devices we might have in five years? So, and, and what, kind of, um, what kind of amperage do you have to have and what will that be? One advantage of having the built-ins is that space. It, it requires less space to have the built-ins. Um, on the other hand, possibly a disadvantage of it is the ease in which um, the, the devices are put in for charging. The carts are fairly easy to have the everything charged at the same time. You basically just have a push-in system. So th that is being discussed and will have to be decided. The cart part, if we go carts, it does not need to be decided right now as part of the um, the technology budget for the school, which, by the way, is about six hundred. It is six hundred thousand dollars for technology, and it's six hundred thousand for F and E, the furniture and equipment. If if we go carts, will we'll come out of that? The the built-ins have to be decided now because it's all part. Because once we through, finish schematics, then we go into construction drawings, and that's it needs to be in that. One of the um, the other and talks about finish and that we're going to have some more discussion on is when we were talking with teachers, they felt that they needed to have some built-ins for um, materials for the kids when they come into a class. Where are they going to put all of their things? And so we're looking at that as well. And possibly it might even be that it's it's in the furniture. But the, again, if, if it's decided to have it be a more mobile, kind of storage, then you don't have to have it in the schematics. Mm -hmm. So that's so that's where we are. We're really focused on the physical. There's so many other things that we need to talk about um, as we, at, once we get over this piece of it, and um, we will. Mm -hmm. the, the, the good thing is that the, it has a pay, it rhythm to it, and there's a lot of things we do have to figure out, but we have a year and a half, right. which is great. <clears throat> okay, um, do you want to talk about Hardy? Yes, let me talk a little bit about Hardy. Um, as you know, the School Enrollment Task Force has recommended that there be a six-room addition. So where we are right now is there's been a rough estimate of what the cost of that could be. and it's a, I'm not even sure I should say what it is right now because it, it has some, it's a tentative. And a reason why I say it's tentative because one of the things that the School Enrollment Task Force also asked about was should we be looking at any ways to increase course spaces, specifically around the cafeteria in Hardy. And so uh, we asked the architect that had been doing the, uh, the study to take a look at that issue. And in fact, I just have a cost estimate with three different options for what we might be able to do about the cafeteria. So this report will go to the School Enrollment Task Force and some discussion about that, and that, that meeting's in a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. So we will, we will take a look at that. Also going on simultaneously, we're having um, a second a peer review on cost estimates, because we need to make sure we're pretty set on what these costs are gonna be, uh, because as you know, Hardy is going to be uh, funded uh, primarily from the capital plan do we what what type of dates are we looking at in terms of starting we do not know that yet no okay. Mm -mm. okay great according to the paper it's 100 percent in the capital plan well, yes it was in the paper today 100 percent they decided Hardy did they put the decided huh oh, they put the amount in it yeah, yeah. The well there's check. some <laughs> uh, there's good source <laughs> But they have a number. Yeah, I don't know if they pu they published the number because mm -hmm. they did. They, they published, did. They yeah, published them. Yeah. Well, the number that was in on the capital the plan. plan. Yeah. How much did they? It's three, three, three and a half. Is in the cap. It's it's already it's in the capital plan. I mean, it's that's pretty widely known. It's yeah. No, it's plan. in the capital yeah. plan. It's yeah. in the capital plan. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, but that's being peer reviewed right now, and and um, we haven't discussed the cafeteria piece as well. So and there's a lot more work to be done on this. But you have to be able to see if you, if Just if the magnitude of of this kind of renovation could be in, could be managed within our plan planning. Just a clarification: mm -hmm. You're saying the 3.5 is just for the construction, not the additional. It's everything, but that is it. But including the cafeteria expansion. <coughs> 
does not okay. include that. We don't know if that can be included in it yet. What I'm just okay. saying. That's the method the capital plan is. No, no, I'm, I'm not questioning that. I, I just want to make it clear that what we're talking about, what the capital plan planning is talking about is the addition on the building, not expanding core, core spaces. Am I correct? The 3.5 is an estimate of what the entire cost would be. There may be capacity within that number for um, some renovation of the, of the cafeteria space. But as I said, right now, that number is being peer reviewed and I can't, I don't have the information to give you. I'm not trying to hold you there. I yeah. just want to be clear. Thank you. Okay. Um, I do have a couple others. Um, one is I, I, I we, we talked, um, Allison and the central office, uh, give it a little bit of a report on where we are with the, um, I don't know, if, is that possible tonight? Just an outline of where we are in the timeline on the committee. Yeah, safe and supportive schools, yeah. So um, we have, uh, we received the grant from the state and we have um, worked with a consultant from the Assabet Valley um, Collaborative to develop um, what the consultation will look like as the teams roll out their work. So um, we're looking to have building level teams with representation from each grade level, um, content area, cluster depending on how the school is organized as well as representatives from special education and other specialties uh, you know <laughs> art or phys ed um, the teams will meet to um, work with the consultant around completing the safe and supportive schools um, self-assessment which is part of the requirement of the grant um, once the teams complete that for their individual school they will then work at the building level to develop priorities and then um, devise action plans to implement those priorities. So we're looking to start uh, with uh, these sessions in February going through the end of June when action plans will be due. Um, if for some reason they're unable to complete the action plan by June, there is um, some uh, resources in the grant so that they can continue work in the summer if they've do complete the action plan, then we can begin implementation in the summer as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Right. So we're beginning. We're going to be putting out the the, the stipends mm -hmm. for teachers at every single school. Um, well, actually, the, the K through eight uh, at this point. K through eight. Pre K through eight, right? Pre K through eight, and um, be moving forward. So you're going to have. Uh, I don't know if we we'll probably midway through this, we'll be able to give you some more updates in terms mm -hmm. of what's happening with this but then at the end of the the end of this period of time we should have uh, a report in terms of you know actions going forward in the next year and AEF has already indicated interest in um, supporting implementation activities great mm -hmm. so, so there's nothing in the original grant for implementation no. it's specifically a planning grant, planning grant. Okay. Uh, if there is remainder after you've completed your action planning for the summer, you can move into some implementation, but it's specifically a, a planning grant. Mm -hmm. Moving forward. All right, I still more. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> All right, keep going. All right, uh, administrative searches. Um, we have uh, three searches that we know of at this point. Um, we will be beginning, uh, we've already posted the position for a, a chief financial officer and probably usually you'll have this three or four weeks so we expect that um, we will beginning doing interviews if not before February vacation certainly right after um, we mentioned uh, we're the actual hiring agent for that position yes after you do the clearing with Robinson we, we you and I talked about how many uh, the com how many people the committee might want to see do coming. You Quick discussion. I mean, yeah. to keep it going as fast as we can. Would you? The, the start. What we've put in the um, the uh, posting is that it's a July first or earlier. Uh, we certainly don't want to be in the position of disrupting another school district in the middle of a school year, um, but it may be that somebody is available. So we don't know. Um, we could. My suggestion on the number would be to wait to see what the applicant pool is like. Okay. And you know, if, if the committee would like to interview 
two candidates instead of just one candidate or three candidates, we can talk about that. Mm -hmm. Just keep so, us informed so how it's going. Absolutely. So, right. mm -hmm. And our timing then is we're hoping to interview. It would probably be not until March sometime. Right. It, it may, may be later. What we're going to do is keep this open until we hire someone. Mm -hmm. okay, great. Whatever that, whatever it takes. Great. Thanks. Um, so we also have um, an interim principal at the middle school, which I know you're all aware of in the, mm -hmm. in the community as well. We will be, we are going to be posting that position. And as we have in other principal searches, um, we will have an advisory committee that will be consist of um, administrators, teachers, counselors, and parents um, from the middle school. And, and actually, I've been thinking about whether maybe we'd have at least one representative from um, the, the fifth grade class since they will be entering the school next year. So that, that information will go out to parents asking them if they're interested in uh, serving on that committee, and I'm actually going to have them send them to Mr. Spiegel. Okay. Um, so we will, we will put that committee together. However, the committee will probably not uh, meet until early March. Right now, our timeline for this is to post it three to four weeks, but that puts us right at February vacation. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we will um, do the prel some preliminary interviews um, that week of March 6th. And then we will go into the next phase of it after that, assuming that there are candidates at that point. We will, again, like any of our searches that we've done in the past, we'll just keep it open for a period of time. If, if we don't have many applicants by after February vacation, we may extend it a while before we actually create um, a group of candidates to be interviewed. Mm -hmm. The compensation for this from the way I understand it, it would be more or less like a stipend for going forward until the beginning of the first year, till July 1st of 2018? Mm -hmm. huh? oh, are we talking about the Gibbs or are we talking about Audison? No, no, this is Audison. 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 So th that position would be starting on July 1st? Then. That's right. Okay. Right. So I guess for this, this part, we don't really have any part of the hiring, but we have the, we have the issue of compensation. Yes. So I guess I would ask you in a future executive session, bring a proposal for that to the uh, committee. For that. Thank you. We'll do that. Do we need to look at the um, the job description, or do we already have something that we? We've had a job description. You will changing. need you will need it for the Gibbs because that's a new position, right. and we're we're going to bring that to you. But I will say is that what we've done, if, if people recall, when we hired a high, a middle school principal, and it, when we hired a high school principal. We, when we got to the point where we, we had finalists, um, we did create opportunities for parents to, and teachers to meet with those candidates and provide some feedback. Um, so at this point, it remains to be seen where, where that will be. And, and given um, some history here, we, when, we, when we hired, the last time we hired a middle school principal, it took us two years to do that. Mm -hmm. We went out the first year, did not find the candidate that we wanted, then we advertised the second year. The same thing happened with Dallin School. Now, in other searches, we were, we were able to do it with one search. So I, I do want to say that what's more important to, to me, and I'm, I'm quite certain to all of you and to the school, is that we find the right person. And of course, what is that right person is hard to say. I mean, everybody has a different, uh, uh, certainly probably some, some common attributes and then some things that would, might differ. But it's a, it's a process and we'll keep you informed as to where we are, but this is the rough timeline is that the first, um, potentially the first time we would do any interviewing would be the, that week of March 6th. All right, and, and then we will have the Gibbs, mm -hmm. and that that because we've got these other ones going on, we're going to push that a little bit later, but that also will have an advisory committee, and in, and we will be inviting teachers. In fact, I, I believe already we have teachers that are going to be on that committee. When by contract, when we hire someone who's an administrator, 
who does evaluation, the, the teachers that are, uh, serve on the committee are elected by their colleagues. And so that has happened. I don't think that the one for the Odyssey Middle has happened yet, but that's, I know that's going to happen in the next week or so. So we will have that committee as well. Um, and we'll probably have something a little bit further along in the process for that. All right. So when are we when are we thinking of starting the process then? Well, we have to get the job description done. It has to be approved by you. Probably would not go out until after vacation sometime. After okay, okay. Mr. Rainer. So, going back to the, my uh, that original question, do you see this as a stipend, part time position for the upcoming year, and then a full time position starting in July of eighteen? I do see it having a stipend with it because it's going to be more For the work. overlap part. Right. There'll be right. more work during this period of time, yes. Right. And then the, the full-time position would be starting for July 1st. July hopefully. 1st, 2018. Right. Okay. So you're talking about a job description for that for our approval. Yes. Uh, we, the, the stipend and stuff. The, <coughs> Do you, that would be a new stipend position as well, so we would be looking at that as all, also? The stipend would not be in the job description. No, no, the, I'm, I'm seeing this as two separate things, maybe with the same person. In other words, the stipend and, and the requirements are going to be getting it together for the, until, uh, through June, of, uh, June 30th, 2018, and then the full-time position right. starting. I don't know what the amount of the stipend would be and it will require a little bit more thought. And the reason why that, it, you know, should the, the, the person that is chosen be an Arlington administrator, there are days that they're going to be working anyway. And um, so we, we just have to look at it. I, I don't right. have a preconceived idea right now what that would be, other than the fact that I do think there, it, it merits some kind of stipend. Thank you. All right, and then budget. 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 <laughs> At the last uh, school committee meeting, uh, we there was a, a presentation and some discussion about where we are with the F, FY17 budget, mm -hmm. and uh, you know we've been talking about the fact that we do have a projected deficit for FY17 in the amount between 800 and 900,000, and there was. The feedback I had received is that there was um, a lack of clarity uh, after that meeting as to, first of all, what were the drivers for this deficit, and secondly, and probably as importantly, how would we fund uh, fund this deficit uh, given our current budget. So I wanted to clarify this. The two drivers for this projected deficit the most important one is, is our out-of-district tuition. And last year when we budgeted for out-of-district, the amount that we budgeted was $7,112,565. That number, at the time we did the budget, was based on really what the actual costs were at that time. That's pretty much how we've always budgeted out-of-district. But things change, and that, that number was in January last year. So things do change, and they did change. And right now, our projected out-of-district costs are $7,889,103. So there is a difference there of, of uh, $7,600,000 over what we thought they were a year ago this time. Longevity is the other driver. It is not as significant of one, but it was budgeted at around 190,000. It is this year turning out to be 303,000 dollars, with a difference of 113. So the total amount of the deficit projected—I say projected deficit—is 889,000. Mr. Hainer. I. Except the, you cannot predict uh, special education and expenses like that. That happens. Uh, periodically we get a reminder and get hit hard, and we did this year. But I've got to say categorically, in my mind, there's absolutely no excuse for the longevity aspect. 
in this time of the year, we know exactly who's in our uh, for budgeting time, who is going to get a longevity increase. And by budgeting that number, the, the upside, if that person doesn't decide to stay here, it, the number will be higher and not expense. $113,224 is an expense, is, in my mind. I'm sharing this, we're there, we have to live with it, but I, I, I don't think there's any excuse whatsoever uh, for that being there. And I'm not laying this on just you, Dr. Bodie, but it, it just shouldn't be there. We have a deficit, we should be $113,000 less in our deficit. Yes, I don't. I don't completely understand why we have the longevity deficit ourselves. Mm -hmm. So, but it is what we have. I'm glad that we know it rather than have a surprise in May when we're reconciling everything mm -hmm. in June and find that we're in that position. We know it right now, and so we're able to identify how we're going to be able to offset um, uh, this amount of money. So, in the second. Uh, slide I'm giving you looking at where the sources of revenue would be for this we have as you know a special education stabilization account that was um, that is, has been established by town meeting um, several years ago we, we were able to fund put this amount of money in terms of savings that particular year and to mr. Hainer's point there is a lot of um, peaks and valleys mm -hmm. over a long stretch of time in special education spending, and particularly determined by out of district. You know, there's, that's just the way that it is, and we've given you many graphs over time to show that. But in a particular year when we uh, had some savings, the money went into the stabilization account, and this year we're going to, to ask town meeting to move that money into the FY17 school department budget. We also um, have a tuition in revolving account um, that um, has been growing. We have not been needing to tap into it in the last few years, and you have the amount there. In fact, it's almost identical to the amount in the stabilization account. So roughly speaking, we have here now $700,000. In the legal, and this actually might be a higher number, but if you notice in the um, sources of reductions that we're, we would be uh, thinking about, which we will talk about a little bit later, think about in terms of for next year from the FY17 to FY18 budget, we believe that given our actuals, we could reduce the legal budget by around 100000 mm -hmm. That's because this year we're going to need to spend less. So that money that is budgeted could be another offset. So that leaves roughly 140000 And if necessary, we can go to the foreign visa account. I'm not sure that it's going to be necessary because as we go through the rest of the second part of this year, um, we may be able to find uh, additional savings and other line items, which we are watching very carefully. Now, not included in this analysis are other potential sources, that, if should we need them. Um, one is the Extraordinary Relief Fund, and, and uh, mm -hmm. Ms. Elmer is going to talk a little bit Briefly, more about this. Um, so there's, there's a mechanism um, under which, if you anticipate that your circuit breaker claim will be 25% greater than 125 percent greater than the um, previous years that you can apply for extraordinary relief for this year so um, we have been essentially doing our circuit breaker claim now um, to see if we meet that and uh, we do and at the end of February is when you can indicate your um, intent to file for relief um, there is five million dollars earmarked for the state um, for uh, extraordinary relief so depending on who files what the claims mm -hmm. are for the state will then determine if they release funds back to you during the last um, quarter di disbursement so this isn't hundred and twenty five percent of um, the spending but hundred twenty five percent of the what claim. the circuit breaker right. would what give the us claim we made last year mm -hmm. the, the claim for circuit, for circuit breaker, breaker. Right, yeah. right 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 so um, thanks to the people uh, to Andrew Andrea Campbell, Campbell yeah. largely has been doing that work um, 
to act to do the circuit breaker claim. Yeah. So that's one possibility. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, there, there could be savings in the FY17 budget. We'll, we'll see because we're being very careful about spending as we go forward. And then, not that I'm suggesting that we would use this money, um, but rather to know that we always have circuit breaker money from last year sitting in an account. That money is used for next year. We, that's how we've been budgeting. And there's some discussion about that whole issue as we go forward. But that money exists. That money sits there. And um, we, we, we will, the money that's sitting there is the money we will budget for FY18. So I am confident that we're going to be fine at the end of the year uh, because of these sources. And um, I, I, I wish we didn't have this deficit. I, but on the other hand, this is what the needs of the children that needed to out of have out of district placements. I mean, that's we we put children in out of district placements when we do not have the resources and the programs in district to meet their needs. And that's what that's why. But that's what makes it so volatile because you don't know uh, which children are going to be needing needing that kind of service when you're budgeting in January. So that's, a, that's where we are, and um, yes, I, I think we'll be fine at the end of the year. So I just asked this get put into Novus, because it's not yet. Novus chart is not in Novus. It is not Novus, no. but we can yeah. put it in Novus. Let's put it in yes. Novus, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely, under the superintendent's yes. report. Uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Allison Ampey. So going back to longevity, um, what I'd like to ask but we really can't because of the situation is how will we present how will we prevent something like this from happening in the future? You know, what, what are we going to change in our processes? But maybe after we hire a CFO mm -hmm. and after they've been on the job for a while, we could revisit this yes. question and talk about how we can present, prevent something like this from happening in the future. Yes. Mr. Slickman. Yeah, I, I'm concerned about the same thing. And I would like us to consider moving forward that we don't have a longevity line in the budget because the longevity is really the same as another step or lane calculation. We know when we hire the people, we should program that into the system so that we know what we're paying each and every employee in the following fiscal year and, and calculate that into the, uh, the annual adjustment. I, you know that would certainly solve the problem and when we get a new CFO and we can talk about uh, looking for the flags in the system so we know when the longevity steps are due. Mm -hmm. Mr. Hainer. We have a line item in that because I've questioned that several times during uh, the budget reports. I, th that's another reason why I got upset over it. it mm -hmm. It's been in a couple of our reports. It needs to be done better. I agree with you on that. I, I actually, I have to say, I, I like the idea of having a line item in our budget because we just know we can track what the expenses are. We can see what they are. Well, we don't track state lanes and steps no. separately, and it's really the same sort of an automatic mechanism because in that we, we do know who our employees are. We do know their date of employ. Uh, we shouldn't be estimating that at all. That, that, that should be something that we know the exact number of what we're going to pay this person the, the subsequent year unless we're in contract negotiations and we don't know that number. If we, we're in contract negotiations, we don't have a new contract, we put money in reserve, we plug in the old number with the step and lane and longevity increases in, so we have that as our baseline. To have a separate item for longevity it just doesn't seem appropriate to me. And to have that estimated rather than being calculated on real data. I mean, how many employees do we have that right. would be right. possibly eligible for that? It shouldn't be too hard to figure out what our longevity is going forward. Now, I understand that we've done it this way for a long time and it's never been a problem before, but uh, it, it's, it, and I don't want to go to the point of belaboring the situation, but it's certainly something we can improve, we should improve, and I think best practice would be to just include that in the base calculations based on steps and lanes. Mr. Thielman. So could you just kind of, Kathy, summarize how uh, this is informing next year's budget, so how the uh, you know, our district tuition? Yes, I can. 
So how this informs next year is that first, with respect to out-of-district tuitions, we, we've been talking in rough numbers of $800,000. So that has to be in the base budget of next year, an additional 800000 But we've also talked about perhaps having 200000 additional for one million uh, should there be um, other, st other students that have uh, been placed from this point, you know, through uh, next year. Now, there is pros and cons to that. I mean, what we're seeing is that when you do it on the actuals at that point in time, you, you very likely could have a deficits. You could also have savings because people move, placements change. Um, so we've had our own discussions about that too, whether we just go with the actual cost but I think that the actual cost probably right now might be higher than the 800 or potentially higher than that. I, I, I don't know if you could comment on that at this point. That, that. For out of district placements. For the projection next year, when we did the projections for next year, we based that on not only the current students, but you know, if they're leaving mid year because they're aging out at the age of 22, so it is a exact um, account at that point in time. Exactly. It's an exact account at this point in time, but when last year we were in January, we did it at that point in time. Um, and maybe that's what we do, because, but there's, and this is something that budget can talk a little bit more about on this, because what has been proposed by our CFO is that we actually add 200000 to that amount and you have that inform FY18. You could simply go on, in terms of budgeting for next year, what we know are the actuals at this point in time. Which is about 800. Which is about 800,000, mm -hmm. yes. So, I mean, it's, if, if we end up incurring more expenses, then it's going to impact next bu mm -hmm. year's budget. But it's gonna, but if we have the cushion, the impact would be less than having to absorb it in some way next year, should that be the case. So the argument, it's, it's, a, it's a question that we're going to have to wrestle with here over the next couple of weeks. Where we are right now in the budget, product, the, the budget document is that today, uh, the superintendent's budget went to the printer. So you're going to have that mm -hmm. fairly soon. I think probably in another week. Um, certainly a week before um, uh, certainly a week before we have the the presentation on, on February 9th but then we have a couple of meetings where there's gonna be you know there's gonna be some discussion about this as to what assumptions you want to make and then what we will be doing is making changes in in the uh, the budget as presented so that at the point we come to in March where we vote on the budget, it will be your budget. And so some of your thinking has to come into this as well. And it's, it's just really an, it's an issue. <laughs> Do you want to put the 200 into the out of district line item or do you want to put the 200 into something else? Knowing that full well next year, we could be you know, revisiting this again. Does budget have a recommendation, or do you want to um, Budget doesn't have a recommendation on that specifically mm -hmm. at this point. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, anything? Uh, so do, is this well, something we could. to I, go over, is this? I was gonna go, but we're talking about the, um, the reduction, right. and do you wanna talk about it now in the, my report, it, or do you wanna wait to budget subcommittee? It's totally up to you. Well, since we're talking about money, maybe this, we'll just keep going here. Is this all that we have left for the superintendents, mm -hmm. or there are there? I don't, ha oh, I had one other thing, and it's very quick. Why don't we do that other thing first? Yeah, then. and the other thing is, Dave Ardito is going oh, yes. to, who yes. is our director of visual arts, mm -hmm. and who helps inspire our teacher for these wonderful exhibits, is receiving an award from, the Arl from ACA, the Arlington uh, Council of Arts, this coming Saturday night, it's the day, it's Alan McLennan Art Award, and it's given, being given to him for his tireless advocacy on behalf of arts and arts education, both in the schools and the community. And I want to congratulate him. It's certainly well deserved. He's done an, an amazing job as our director of visual arts. 
-hmm. And uh, as I said, well, well deserved. So congratulations, Dave. And I also want to thank ACA mm -hmm. uh, that they have offered four tickets to this event, which is a fundraiser. So it's a, the tickets are a little pricey. Um, have offered four tickets to four art teachers to be able to be there, uh, you know, with uh, Dave when he get, receives his award. And there was a quick response to that, I might add. <laughs> um, so we do have four art teachers that are going. Medical. Pardon? Medical. Yes, thank you. And then the other thing, and, and have Mr. Mr. Haina talk about this, Last week, we had a, uh, a potluck in Boston with um, our Medco students and their families. And we actually had a quite a large turnout of Arlington um, residents, teachers, administrators, and students. Um, students from the high school uh, came, to, came to the event. Maybe you might want to hear some comments from the student council yeah. representative. That'd be great. Yeah. yeah. So a bunch of us went to the event. Uh, Mr. Mr. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, take this, yes. <laughs> um, so a group of us went to the event. We met here and took the bus in. Um, it was definitely a great experience because we got to meet a lot of the families who are involved in the community. Um, we know personally a lot of the students who go to the mm -hmm. school, but it was great because um, we actually realized how large a community we're involved in, and it really helps <coughs> to unite us, and mm -hmm. we did different mixer activities mm -hmm. definitely a great experience and it would be great to do it again okay well i have to yes. say the student council students really got into the activity you want to tell them a little <laughs> bit about it yeah um so there was a bingo like a person bingo sheet and we all went around and you know met different community members and i know there were a lot of teachers and um different staff members there as well as parents um and then we all ended up sitting at separate, well, tables based on stickers that they put in our name tags, which definitely gave us the opportunity to talk to people we might not have reached out to before. Um, and then there was a lot of young children there as well from the community and the little boy who won the activity. Uh, <laughs> there was a category that asked for a twin and there weren't any twins there and so he just simply drew a line from this free space into the twin space. So <laughs> it was a great bonding activity overall. It was, fun. It was a lot of fun. Definitely. And, and I wanted to thank Mr. Hainer. He was there um, and, and actually was a contributor to the, the, to the food um, of the event. It was great food and we had plenty of it and plenty of desserts, but he did a, it was, it was a terrific job of organizing it. And, and you actually were sort of the MC with um, Ms. Thomas. Margaret Thomas, our Medco director, uh, she put a tremendous amount of effort in organizing it. She got the building for us. Uh, she ordered all the food, the major part of the food. The desserts were, is what each of the contributors, the uh, p families brought. Uh, I had to start a diet a week before and I ate two tangerines the whole night with all this food. It was, it was horrendous. You know how, much, how great the food was. Uh, the people were wonderful. We anticipated 60 people participating. We had over 80 people come. Uh, right in the middle, we ended up adding tables and stuff. It was a wonderful social event. At the end, uh, there was a sign-up sheet for those people that wanted to move forward. We had uh, 15 people from the Boston part of our community and uh, as much uh, from the Arlington part. And we're looking forward to getting together and having another uh, social here in town uh, within the next month or so. It was. And I want to thank Dr. Bodie for providing a bus. Uh, one of the rare times we bust into Boston instead of busting out <laughs> of Boston. Uh, and uh, they timed it really well. Just at the time for cleanup, the bus had to leave. But uh, it worked out well. No, it, was, uh, it was a wonderful, exciting experience. Thank you thank very you. much. All right. So th those, that's the report. And if we want to move into so after the feel good, we're talking about budget. <laughs> Um, yeah, so why don't we just go right into budget right now? Let's discuss right, 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 more. Right. What? Should we do the consent yeah. agenda and then go? Well, to so I mean, this was a continuation of the superintendent's report to go into the, yeah. this discussion, or we, we can do it the other way. It doesn't matter. To the consent. Okay. Okay. So we'll we'll do it in the regular order. Okay. Right. Um, so, uh, so and 
So you, that's it for the. Okay. That's it. That's it. Okay, great. Um, okay, so consent agenda. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted with one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered its normal sequence. Approval of warrant, warrant number 17108, total warrant amount $903,000 or million, sorry, thousand and seventy-eight dollars and fifteen cents, dated 112, 2016. Approval of minutes, none. Approval of trip, Arlington High School Mass School Council Association trip, March 2017. Um, so moved. Moved by Mr. Hainer. Do we need to move by Mr. Hainer? Second. Yeah. Okay, second. By Mr. Sullivan. All in favor? Aye. 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 It's unanimous. Any opposed? Okay. Um, policy to review, none. Uh, subcommittee and liaison reports and announcements. So then we go into budget. Okay. So budget met on Monday, Tuesday, I don't remember. Yesterday, um, yesterday well, Wednesday. <laughs> um, and we discussed the FY18 budget. The administration had brought to us, to this meeting, a list of budget reductions, which you have a sheet of, right. it looks like this. Which is on Novus as well. Um, and it's on Novus as well. Um, it's the top part of the sheet. It's listing things that either um, like the photocopier lease, it was an estimate before and the actual turns out to be less, so there's available funding. So these are things, either unfilled positions or um, the TAs are reductions to bring all the TAs across the district down to parity um, because right now there's actually significantly more in some schools than others. and. This is trying due to, to enrollment numbers. Do it due to enrollment just numbers. Doing a reset button on yeah. this. Mm -hmm. um, etc. So we reviewed those. Um, the administration also brought the additions to the budget that they would like to see. Um, and that's the second part of the sheet. Um, and so we discussed all of this. We didn't really have any significant ch questions or changes about these parts of. I didn't say that, but we weren't mm -hmm. trying to. Ch no, I mean about this part. No, well, I mean, not <coughs> so so yeah, this will be presented in the superintendent's budget, mm -hmm. and then we'll, we'll have opportunity to yeah. comment on it then. Right. As far yeah. as whether we feel maybe a different priority is more sure. important than some of the priorities that they've come forward with. But this is what the administration the administration team has uh, put together. Okay, but, but, but I think you could comment. Significant questions weren't raised yesterday. They may exist, but they weren't raised yesterday. Um, so the other thing that we discussed was the use of part of the circuit breaker, um, which we had discussed at full school committee um, last meeting. So first, the administration is very much against this idea. Um, however, the budget subcommittee still feels that it's something that we would like to consider. We weren't able to fulfill Cindy's request for something that would give you a financial projection of what it would look like next year if we did that. We're still working on this. Um, what some the of the circuit breaker would look like, or what? I'm sorry, what financially? What would it look like if we if we use some of the circuit breaker this year mm -hmm. and then you know moving forward what would what would happen in the future um and without that documentation i didn't feel comfortable bringing a specific recommendation mm -hmm. to you all um because i feel like we haven't done our our mm -hmm. background work mm -hmm. but what we'd like to do is just get a sense sort of a straw poll of where you folks are thinking. You know, do you feel like we've made enough headroad into the four million or so of asks by addressing eight hundred thousand dollars worth of them? Or do we want to try and go further using some of the circuit breaker, understanding that The administration is very much against this idea. Um, they feel it's risky. I personally don't agree it is as risky as 
I'm hearing it discussed, um, and I don't think the rest of the budget subcommittee does either. Um, but I'm just telling you, it's, it's, there's very different views here. Mm -hmm. So we can work on getting numbers and stuff for you. But first, I just want a sense of where, where do you guys think it? Um, so, Mr. Cardin wants so, to... Uh, just to get a, li a little bit more clarity, so we can continue working on it, mm -hmm. and three of us feel that it's worth continuing to work on, but mm -hmm. we want to get your sense as to that. So, once uh, is it Andrea uh, completes the estimated claim for this year, if you could give us that number, that will help with our calculation for what the circuit breaker will be next year. Um, so, if you could provide that to us, that would be helpful. So, then we'll have an, a more concrete number as to what our increase is going to be mm -hmm. in Circuit Breaker, and that will help us run the numbers mm -hmm. in the future years to see what the impact would be mm -hmm. of moving some of that spending or some of that funding forward. Right. If enough people feel it's worth pursuing that. Okay, Mr. Thielen. So uh, I guess how would you respond to this question? You know, we're operating in a deficit this year, which we can cover with reserve and other funds, and. The budget subcommittee is proposing that we uh, go above the administration's recommendation in next year's budget. So how would you, you know, what's your, what's your, I mean, we were happy, we have this issue this year. How do we make, why, why should we do this given that? What so we will, we will still, sorry. Yeah, no. Go ahead. No, 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 I, I think I, I think, I think, yes, we're all budget. The budget <laughs> should. Mm -hmm. Oh, so you guys are all this on budget. We're all budget. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Slogan, do you want to answer, do you want to talk to that? Uh, yeah, I, I would right. talk to Mr. Thielman's point in that uh, we have an extraordinary spike in uh, special ed expenditures this year, and we're seeing that in terms of the uh, deficit was pre uh, presented to us. A lot of that, we hope, is good. Uh, it will be reimbursable under Circuit Breaker and through the um, extraordinarily relief program this year so essentially what's happening we have a, a spike in expenditures this year and if we take a hundred percent of our circuit breaker money and park it next year we don't get to uh, access it until fiscal 2019 and you know I, I understand the need to be conservative with the circuit breaker amount so we don't get into a situation where we estimated a larger number than we're actually going to receive. Uh, we, however, at this point, we do know what the number is in House One. We know how much circuit breaker money is, is the bare minimum uh, to come out, which is in the neighborhood of this year's amount. So we're not going to get a big increase in circuit breaker uh, percentage rates uh, over, over this year. In, unless the legislature really goes aggressively to add to it, and they might, but at least we have a baseline number that it's not going to fall below the number that's being put out in the House One budget. So we have a sense of the uh, of the amount of funding for Circuit Breaker. We will be getting a spike in reimbursements next year due to the increase in costs this year. Now, to take that that expense is going to roll over to next year and it's going to be more expensive for us to educate those children and I think that we need to be taking some of the money we're getting from the reimbursement to align to the expenditures we're making for, for special ed and remember the purpose of the circuit breaker is to reimburse us against high cost special ed costs if the high cost special ed costs are increasing and, the, and if we don't use the additional circuit breaker uh, to cover that, we're essentially moving costs from our operating budget to cover the difference in the, uh, the uh, out-of-district spend cost. So I think that it's prudent for, to us to figure out what, what, a, what a conservative number is for subsequent uh, for next year's uh, uh, circuit breaker number, not budget that out, but take a look at that increase that we're being hit with. Otherwise, we're hit with the increase this year, we're hit with the increase next year, and we're not getting the increase in the, in the circuit breaker until two years out. And to be hit with a, uh, with a significant additional expense for two years before we actually are able to go and recover some of the reimbursement for that I, I think it is not 
the right thing to do. I'm just thank you, Paul. I'm just trying to understand the, the difference of opinion. That, that's all I'm trying to do. So I didn't, didn't don't need too much explanation. We've yeah. had a pattern the last few years, fortunately, where we are always able to have some clear, some surety when we budget the next year based on the circuit breaker number. You remember the years we'd, we'd be asking, well, what's going to be the percentage? You know, and then, and sometimes even when we got the percentage on a house one budget, it could change mm -hmm. uh, later on. In fact, that happened to us more than once, unfortunately. So there's that uncertainty as to what you'll have is your revenue sources. We have clarity about town appropriation because we work well together yeah. to figure out these formulas. We know that. The only thing we we it's always been a wild card is circuit breaker, and then of course grants. Mm -hmm. Title one, uh, you know, goes. You know, if you look at the pattern over ten years, it goes up and then it goes down. And so maybe we're just following that pattern in the next next year to bring it down. But title one isn't such a big chunk of our budget like circuit breaker and special ed costs. So mm -hmm. it's just mm -hmm. our experience from years ago when we didn't have this budgeting tool. Mm -hmm. Now that we have it, if we if we start taking the cream off of it. That what well, that's due to the bump. We still are going to have those costs potentially in FY19, but now the circuit breaker that you're moving into 19 may not have the sufficient money. So that's why you're opposed to their. That's why I'm oppo opposed to doing it, and that's why we spent time in seeing. We we agree that that we need. There are some things we need a lot, and so we spent a lot of time trying to figure out where could we make some cuts that would have minimal impact. So actually, can I get um, for the public's benefit an explanation of what Circuit Breaker is? Because I know that probably um, we all know what it is, but <laughs> there might be some people out there who don't. I'm going to give it over here to the expert. <laughs> I don't know if Mr. Carter wants to explain. <laughs> but um, so when they set the foundation amount, um, there's a mechanism for the state to reimburse for high cost special ed, which is set at four times that. So roughly this year it's in the $43,000 range. So for expenses over that amount, we get reimbursed at a rate of up to 75% of that amount. Right. Um, and what Dr. Bodie's talking about is been, it's been around 70% for the last few years, going up to 75 at times. And <coughs> it's, if they're going to fully fund it, it, the last disbursement we get that year will be a larger disbursement. Um, so it is typically unknown. And so the fact that we're carrying over the full amount, it's a fixed amount that we know. Um, so roughly, if, if you had a tuition that was $100,000, take forty two or 43000 out of that, that remaining percentage, 57, we get up to 75% of that $57,000. Okay, thanks. Okay, Mr. Hainer. We have become dependent on a lot of our grants and going forward. Mm -hmm. As Dr. Bodie just said, we can't depend on them. They go up, they go down, they're at the whim of the legislature, federal and state. Uh, my concern about touching the circuit breaker money is that it opens the door going forward, treating it as a revenue source, a regular revenue source, which it is to some degree, but again, that it's at the whim of the legislature, uh, as a lot of our stuff. I would not support this uh, at all. Ms. Starks. Can I ask some questions on this? Yeah, I think. Yeah. Um, it has here uh, music. Where is that? What is that for? Music. Half of a eighty thousand dollar person. Is that elementary, mm. middle school, high school? Well, that's for is the uh, this edition. This is for the Not director. The this is for the director. The performing arts director. Right? Performing arts director. Just music. Yes, I don't know why it got chopped off like that. It was. It yeah. should say performing art director. Yeah. And, and the idea the idea is to fund the administrative part of it, 0.5. Right. We already have in the budget right now, 0.2. Um, we could either hire someone that would be half time, like Mr. Ardito, or we could have somebody come in and have a half teaching assignment and half administrator, because we would have probably that capacity to need the point five teachers. So we have some leeway there. Okay. Um, and also, I noticed there's no high school dean on here. There is no high school dean on here. Um, 
would the high school like the, a dean? Yes, but they also need 2.0 FTEs to cover core classes. And the director of social emotional learning and guidance is going to be able to, to take away some responsibilities from one of the deans. Um, a significant responsibility, which is oversight of the guidance department. So it'll be freeing up some time there. In addition, we will be able to um, do some, some contracted pieces to get some special projects done. So the idea is to sort of help there. It doesn't completely solve the issue. Next year, the increase is about 60 students, and I, but I, I think that the following year, that would, that would definitely be on our radar screen as, the, as one of the top priorities as the dean at the high school. Okay. Um, and my other question is, um, I, if I remember correctly, it, the asks were for more TAs, mm -hmm. and we're cutting <coughs> almost eight TAs. <laughs> yes, we have so some reserves. I don't reserves. understand that at all. Yes. <laughs> well, how we've worked it out at the, at the elementary, and we have to do a reset button. We do have some reserve TAs in the budget still. Um, but what can happen if, you're not, if we don't do this reset every year is that you get a large class TA, which can happen in kindergarten, and then they roll over to the next year. And so what we do every year, and we're doing it again this year, is just look at it. So the way elementaries are staffed for TAs, there is the halftime TA for all the kindergartens. Each special education teacher has one TA they work with. We have a building sub, and in two large buildings, we have two building subs, and we have the paraprofessional library. Did I cover everything correctly? I think that's, I think that's, and then, okay. A, the program. Pardon? Plus the program. And plus the program TAs. I mean, I'm not, I'm not talking about the program TAs. That's sort of a separate right, look right, at yeah, it. Separate, yeah. Yeah. But now, does it mean that we won't be putting additional TAs in we, if we hire the learning specialists? Yes. If we have large classes, we, we do that. We try to make that work. In a, and same thing with, with the kindergarten. So, yes, I, there's the need for that. We don't doubt that. But then what we're going is, okay, it's like, what do we really need the, from our point of view as administrators? And of course, we're going to be looking at what you think, too. We have to find some ways to have some economy and some reductions in order to get some other things. Because there's just no, the, once you do the rollover of steps and lanes, longevity, everything, and special education costs, there's $100,000. No, That's I it. understand that. But I'm, I'm, so is this mean that bracket will have a kindergarten that doesn't get a half-time TA, and Hardy will have four kindergartens without no. TAs? No. Every, every, every kindergarten will have a half-time TA, every kindergarten. I don't expect any increases in kindergarten teachers next year. Our needs for classroom teachers are going to be at other grades than that. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so I guess when I think about whether or not to use Circuit Breaker, I think that part of what I need to think about is what are the absolute must-haves? And if we can't fund the absolute must-haves, then I would back going after some of that money. If we can fund the must-haves, then I feel like we don't need to go after that money. Um, I think that the high school dean is a must-have um, so at this point, I would certainly back going after some of that money if it can't be added in here or we can't find that funding. But that's, mm -hmm. that's the way I think about it. I absolutely would rather not go into that money at all, <coughs> but I think that we can't really, I can't make that decision until I have a list of the things that we absolutely have to have in order to run this school system next year. And the amount of money that we have to do that, and if they don't add up, then we have to get the money from somewhere. Um, so uh, that, or we should start a class in how to make money. <laughs> okay. Print it, print it. Be a long line for that class. Printing, yeah. I think 
we, we spend a lot of time, we have a lot of discussions going on, and we, as far as I know, in the six years I've been on this committee, we've deferred to the educational experts. I think it's important to hear, hear their, mm -hmm. the, the education mm -hmm. experts and their feelings on this. And I'm not asking for them to come forward. I think we've already heard it. They, they, they're not supporting the idea of going after the, using the circuit breaker. And they're the ones that are going to, they're the ones that are going to be impacted on this uh, as, as a result. So that's my opinion. Budget's ours, and it's a policy document. I'm not questioning. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Um, budget's ours. It's a policy document. It's our decision. I think that it's the role of the superintendent to uh, give her best recommendation, and I'm very appreciative of that. And, and, and I'm reluctant at almost any time to uh, step on that uh, and go in a different direction. Uh, but I think that this has to be an option we have on the table. Now, I'm not ready to vote it right now, and I don't think any of us should. But as we move forward, we should take the budget as it's presented, take a look at what, where we're at, Take, take some real careful looks about what that circuit breaker number might be coming into the, in the subsequent year. Uh, look at what needs we're, we're peeling off and, and know that this is an option for us that should be on the table if, as um, Ms. Starks is saying, we're making cuts in services that, that we shouldn't be. Because to make cuts from must-haves and put extra money in the bank, I think, is shortchanging the, the students mm -hmm. in, in, in the subsequent fiscal year. Um, if, if it is a prudent methodology, and I don't want to be re reckless about this, I don't want to go past a very safe and conservative number on the circuit breaker, but we're, in, in essence, spending money this year, taking the reimbursement next year and holding it and, and not spending it for another year out. And I understand why we do that. And it was a good move to do it when we did. And we had enough of a cushion in our budget that we could afford to take one year's worth of circuit breaker and put it aside and have this revolve out. But given the fact that the circuit breaker, the, uh, the out of district costs got, went up significantly this year, which will trail into next year, and we're not going to take the reimbursement for those additional expenses that delta, that difference is impacting what else we can do until two years out. I think, I think that has to be on the table. And let's do a budget now based on not changing our circuit breaker practice, but that should be a, an element in our toolkit that we have. And when we come down to the end of it and we look at the final budget and say, oh my God, uh, we, we need more reserve positions for enrollment or we need uh, there are unmet needs in, in, in the budget because this budget is looking very tight right now. We should have the option to go there and be informed about the amounts and the projections before we do it. Right now we're having, in, in essence, one of the best conversations we've had at this table in a long time. This, this is a really thoughtful conversation. And the, the, we have an interesting range of opinions. Um, and. And this is what the public is entitled to see. And I'm so proud to be a member of this committee right now because of, of the way we're discussing it. But the fact that we're having now a discussion based on what might we do versus uh, when we get the numbers and look at it is setting the stage. It's giving the superintendent information. It's alerting the community that we're, that we're struggling with this. And I welcome the clarity of sharper numbers later in the process when we have a better sense of where we're going to land up. So thank you to my colleagues. Thank you to the Budget Committee. Thank you, Mr. Cardin, for bringing us on the table. This has been a great discussion. Mr. Cardin. Uh, oh, uh, no, go ahead. Um, so, okay, so, so the kindergarten TAs, mm -hmm. full-time kindergarten TAs, was the highest priority last year. Mm -hmm. We didn't fund that, but we were able to add some of them because of class size. But now we're saying that's just not a priority anymore. Is that correct? And that is, that is. The is a higher priority? Exactly. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of priorities. There's the $4 million worth of priorities. And that's not even counting the other things that might have been, well, we would like to have these. There's a lot of priorities. 
But then when you look at it from another lens a year later, you see other things that, uh, frankly, have a higher priority. So that, that actually was one of the things that's made it very challenging to do that striped list that we've had, we had last year. Um, but yes, and, and would we agree with that, that having full-time TAs would be desirable? Absolutely. The yes. other uh, two other points. Um, I, I do feel that the secondary level continues to be neglected. And I think part of that is because you've got seven principals arguing for their elementary schools and two principals arguing for their secondary schools. Um, and, I, and I don't think, you know, they're asking, they were asking for four, four FTE, two, two, two for last year they didn't get and, and two this year. So I still think we're underfunding there. So I, I see a lot of critical needs that we're, we're just not meeting. Mm -hmm. And the, the question is, to simplify is, are we going to park 2.1 million next year, if that's what the estimated uh, circuit breaker is, or are we going to park 1.8 million next year? This year we're parking 1.7 million. So we're still, Jeff, going to have a lot of money parked, but the question is, are we gonna park all of it, or are we gonna skim some of it off the top to fund these critical needs? Because part of the largest reason we can't fund any of these critical needs is because the, the out-of-district costs went up, the reimbursement for that doesn't come till next year, and our policy, this is completely our policy that we, we, we came up with, that Kirsty came up with, was to hold on to that money. And that, that is the most prudent thing you can do, mm -hmm. but it's not something we've done in the history of the circuit breaker until two years ago. So mm -hmm. it would not be, to me, uh, so extreme or risky or uh, unusual to take some of that money to do this weird timing thing that we have with this sudden large increase, more than a 25% increase in special education costs in one year. So. Mm -hmm. right, well, yes, so it's Kirstie's fault. Yeah, it's my fault. <laughs> 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 that ends it right there. Dr. So Buddy, and then. We were able to do this exactly in this, in a reverse year where, well, actually sort of a similar year where we had high costs, then the cost went down, because that's how it works. Um, I think that this is a policy decision, something you need to think about very carefully. And there's also, yes, you might fund the positions next year, but you have to think about sustainability, too. That's why I'm bringing this now, because I think it's going to take a lot of thought mm -hmm. as we go forward. The other thing I, want, I called your attention to earlier tonight, and that is where the recommendation from the CFO mm -hmm. to a budget one million dollars for next year is a little bit of a departure from how we budgeted out of district in past years. We've actually budgeted them at the cost that they at that moment in that time. Now, if we were to have clearer figures, probably in a couple of weeks. Well, I I just wanted to comment that so. Um, when you actually do the circuit breaker reimbursement, I don't know if people know how it's actually calculated. It's literally going through each IEP, mm -hmm. calculating the service delivery, the type of provider for mm -hmm. each student in each line in their grid. So this isn't a, um, you know, Miss Campbell has other <laughs> responsibilities. She's working on this and she's devoting a significant amount of time to it, but it's, it's not something that is, it's typically done in, um, it's released in May and so that districts use May and June to submit it by their deadline. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we're going to ultimately be doing it twice this year. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be uh, hard to find clarity. We yeah. can tell, uh, you know, there's an estimate of what that increase is going to be. I believe that was provided mm -hmm. to you. But if you're looking for the exact number, that's going to take a while. Right. To so to one of the things that you could think about is whether you want to budget to the actual costs that we know will be necessary for next year and not build that in. So, Clarity, the extra 100,000, um, that is assuming that we're budgeting a million dollars for special Almost 200,000. 200,000. Oh, so, so if we were to budget to actual costs, we would have how much? The, well, right now, you, you have the actual costs that we would have to right. add to last yep. year's cost that's right here. Yep. Now, that might change in another couple of weeks as to what the actual cost would be. But right now, the assumption of, you've heard our, our, our CFO say that 
she would expect the cost to go up in the spring, which they will. They will go up, but that's exactly why we're here with, a, right. with overruns, because we, the costs exceeded whatever costs it may have decreased. I mean, because sometimes mm -hmm. students age out, sometimes students leave the district, that's happened. And so what you sometimes may not see is you might see a closer connection between the numbers in January to um, this point in time, not because we don't have more out-of-district placements, but there's been some other offsets right. that have sort of washed that out. That didn't happen this year. So sustainability is an important thing to think about. But I would not be uncomfortable because, uh, thinking about budgeting to actuals going forward with special education on district. I'd be, I would be okay with that. Because we do then have the backup of circuit breaker. And another thing that we might have um, some backup on for next year is that one, as you know, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chaplain has said that if there's any money over and above what was budgeted for um, Chapter 70, we can have it just like we did last year. I don't think it's going to be as much as last year at all. Or it's anything. not, but it's going to be a little bit. The other thing is, if we get this amount of money from relief of this year, that money that's in the tuition in will not have to be touched. So there, you then it's it's a so we're using that as a reserve so that you have a little bit more cushion so you know just think about this in terms of what we're doing right now what you're going to see in the budget presentation on the ninth and, I, and i'm getting ahead of because usually we don't do this but this is so tight and has so many policy pieces mm -hmm. to this i wanted you to be thinking about it uh, is what you see here that's what you're going to see with the assumption that the circuit breaker is mm -hmm. not is not touched Okay, Dr. Alice Nampi. Okay, so two things. One, I wasn't sure it was clear, but the 105 assumes right. an extra 200 million or 200,000 on. So if we um, don't do that, for, we have so if we don't that, we would have 300,000. Okay, yes. so that's helpful to know. Right. Okay. Um, so then, okay, so this is me either reading into, reading between the lines of the administration and or projecting into it. I'm not sure which, but. My sense is that some of the concern about using circuit breaker is that it's the start of a very slippery slope. Yes. And there isn't much trust that we have breaks mm -hmm. or that we have stopping power. And um, I know myself, I have good confidence in the rest of the budget subcommittee. I feel like we can set a line and not go beyond that. Mm -hmm. but. I think you should be aware of that, that that's really, I think, a lot of the concern. Mm -hmm. um, and also that there is volatility because mm -hmm. the special education costs vary so much and also because mm -hmm. the reimbursement sometimes varies depending. I, I think the when it dropped to 35 for 40%, I think that was a real exception, right. and that was because of other economic forces yeah. going on, and that we could have read that better, but we didn't. Mm -hmm. um, at this point, I don't think that's going to happen. We would know if it was coming, I think, because everything else would be crashing down right. around us, too. Um, but if we were to do this, we need to also be aware that if our costs go down, we need to be squirreling some of the money away mm -hmm. potentially, as opposed to spending it. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's absolutely we mm -hmm. can't because yeah. we won't be getting filling that. If we're not spending it, we're not getting it back in right. circuit breaker. Um, right. So, okay. So I've heard from some of. So the just to summarize, it's a, it's a, it's. A, I'm sorry to go out of turn here, but but it's a. So it's a three hundred thousand dollar difference of opinion in a fifty what million dollar budget. 50, 60. $60 million. So it's a three hundred thousand dollar difference of opinion mm -hmm. between the school committee, budget subcommittee, and the yeah. district leadership, and a sixty million dollar well, budget. Okay. Well, no, there wasn't a there wasn't a proposal yet of how much of the circuit breaker, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that wasn't. We've you don't have an exact. We're talking mm -hmm. around three hundred. That three hundred. Okay. Three hundred thousand. Okay. So just, yeah. that, mm -hmm. just all right. Yes. That, that puts not the having whole thing. actual numbers to work with. Right. Okay. That puts it in perspective. Mm -hmm. All right. But, but it yes it's small in perspective of the entire budget but it's almost 10 percent of the asks that are out there yep. and it mm -hmm. could go a long way to I, I know I, I, I'm, right. not, I'm not 
denying that. Okay. I'm not denying that it can have impact. I'm yeah. just talking about in the grand scheme of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a, right, but we're talking is. impact. Yeah, mm -hmm. very good. That helps clarify. I've, I've taken no opinion on this. I'm just mm -hmm. trying to get information. Okay, mm -hmm. but I need opinion. Uh, I so mean, okay. at least I need it. We need well, yes. here's leaning. No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know I, uh, here's I think you have a majority. So well, here's 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 my here's my opinion. Um, I worry about some of these things um, that are being cut, the reductions that that they are too crucial. And actually, one of my concerns are the subs because we're projecting. We know how how we are we don't have enough subs and that's seriously impacting um uh, teachers abilities to do their jobs and has impacted learning so i mean i think that's that it it's an it's something that's easy to overlook but it's something that is seems really crucial um we're proposing increasing their pay because we recognize it's been hard to find people but at the same time we're Propo uh, the proposal is to reduce the building subs and to reduce <laughs> the use of subs about 60,000. So I worry about that. Um, and I also worry about the uh, TA reductions because I suspect that we are going to get some large classrooms again next year and that we will find ourselves um, need needing that for education, you know, just to make classroom management easier, to give kids individualized attention. Um, and I, you know, so I worry about those too. Um, I, my opinion would be to come up with numbers slightly smaller than the 300, maybe 200. Um, you know, given that we we have the 300, if we don't increase um, the special education costs uh, by that extra 200,000, um, the extra 200 would give us about half a million. Um, we'd also have to rely on some reductions to meet our need but maybe not as much. So that's, that's my opinion. So I would look at it, this is how I would approach it. I would approach it as we have identified the following X number of things that in our opinion, based on conversations with the superintendent and the school committee are the most, are the highest, dean of the, dean of the, of the high school, whatever it is. And because of that, we're recommending $300,000 to be used for these, require, these, these, these things that are needed to make the schools run better. So I would kind of approach it. That's how I would approach it. So I would say the school committee said, <clears throat> we've listened to all the presentations by the high school and the middle school and the elementary school principals. We've listened to the superintendent. We've listened to the teachers. We've done our own research. Our position is that we need a dean at the high school. We need this. We need, it's not in the budget. And we want to fund it with $300,000 out of the circuit breaker. Then uh, I think that's, the good, that's a good way to frame it for me. Okay. That's how, that's, that. We'll go back to the table. That's how I see it. I don't want to make people do more work, but that's yeah. how I kind of see no, it. I would love to, I would love to know what the priorities are, and then it makes it simpler. Okay. Do you feel, you feel you have a sense of the committee? Yeah. Okay. That makes it a lot yeah. harder to vote against. Okay. So we're not we're not taking a vote <laughs> now, and there's yeah. Wait, yeah, Mr. Hardy. On calculating the the out of district costs for next year, um, can we make sure we include expected tuition increases because I think those have been missed those in the past. Mm -hmm. They, they, when they are available, they have been calculated. So, you know, they petition for a tuition increase, and typically we do know about that in the fall. So, if we are aware of it, but we also do a rollover of a three percent, a standard three percent increase. Um, if an individual school has petitioned for a larger increase and it hasn't been decided, we've also put that factor in. Um, just to point out that if we do have to deplete the SPED stabilization fund and the tuition revolving account, and we don't fund the 200000 for next year, and we're only going on actuals, mm -hmm. there's... We have. We're, yeah. yeah. We have it's it. Yeah. No, not a lot of way going. Yeah. Um, so... <laughs> Well, we should yeah. move the question on this one, I think. Well, we're not, we're not voting on it. There's no vote. We're just we're not, we're not, no, no, we're Don't talking. open a door, Jeff. Yeah. No, 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 I mean, it's time to move on. Let's go to the next, 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 okay, so, next committee. Okay, so uh, I think this is potentially a happier one. Uh, committee relations. All right. So right. we have <laughs> She's all excited. Go for it. We had a meeting on Monday, um, and uh, we talked about the dashboard um, and the forums and what was the other thing we talked about? Um, oh, and wanting to work more with um, the Vision 2020 folks. Mm -hmm. So, huh? And the chat. And and there is actually a date. Yes, and and the and the school committee chat. Sorry. Yes. Um, so um, the dashboard uh, is being worked on. Uh, you guys saw uh, 
what has been available and we are working with um, the administration to try to figure out the other things that are still under construction. Um, and so work is continuing on that. Um, as we know, uh, the next school committee chat uh, is Paul and Kiersey. They're gonna be there on February 4th. Um, and- Kickstand uh, Cafe, 11 o'clock. Kickstand Cafe, yes. 11 o'clock. And um, we, uh, thanks to Jeff and um, Bill who did it the last time, and you saw in Novus were their notes. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that that's, that's just a great, great just a list of mm -hmm. things people talk to. Because yeah. what we're trying to do here is just get some idea of what is on people's minds, right? Um, we don't want the conversation that happened, but just kind of the, the items, and I thought that was great. So I really appreciate you guys starting that, given that no one came the day that Jennifer and I <laughs> Well, we hadn't advertised it as, as well <laughs> we as we did. Right. But, but um, just to, for future, it's the first Saturday of the month. It's always the first always Saturday, the first Saturday of the month at 11 o'clock. 11 to 12 at Kickstand yeah. Cafe. Um, and we have gotten better about our uh, public publicity. We will, we will, we will do better publicity. Yes. Um, and then also uh, talking about forums and working with Vision 2020, mm -hmm. uh, we have set our next meeting to be February 13th from five to six mm -hmm. here, and that is going to be a joint meeting with the Vision 2020, or at least part of that education task force, mm -hmm. um, to talk about how we can work together. Um, and about how we can support each other as we go forward with any forums or anything that we want to work on. And there is actually a date of this forum that um, yes, Dr. Chesson is organizing. Good date. It's a date we have a meeting. No, 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 I'm sorry. This is the date of the actual right. forum, yes, which is March, March 9th. 9th is a school committee. We don't have a school no. committee meeting on that date. I have that as a school committee. No. Meeting. No, I think, I, I think, no, yeah. No, that was next year. No, oh. and this year. Maybe. No, no, this year we don't have a meeting that day. No, we do have a meeting during their planning. They're, they have a planning meeting that they're doing, but not the March 9th. So when I have it as I have a, on my calendar still as March 9th, we have a school committee meeting. Yeah, no, I, I, I What's March then? I, I do too. We, I we don't, we don't. Right? I have it on mine. It, it, I have March 9th and okay. March 23rd. First, first 16th and 30th. That's or, next, that's no, next that's year, next Paul. Year. No, that's next year. No, 17, yeah. Second, I have the second and the 16th. We moved yeah, it. Yeah, I don't have the 9th Second, there. 16th and 30th. Okay, March seventh. Yeah, that's right. We moved I just it. Don't have. I don't okay. have those changes. All right. So and so, I think I think keeper of the calendar. I think we can be sure that we don't have something on the ninth. We don't. Okay. We don't have okay. Any okay. Great. So, okay. so that is the, the meeting in March. So that is the meeting. Um, he just said the second and the sixteenth. Second. The sixteenth and the thirtieth. So so the in February. We just have a meeting on February 9th. So the forum on innovative. Um, educational sort of initiatives in Arlington is on uh, Thursday the 9th. And I think the timing is still yet to be determined. Town hall. Thursday, at town hall. March 9th. March 9th, Thursday, March 9th at town hall. Um, and, um, but as, as uh, Ms. Starks mentioned, we're going to be meeting with Vision 2020 to work out more details. Yep. Okay. All right, and that's it. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, so, uh, district accountability, curriculum, instruction, and assessment. That's another big. Well, it, well it's not so big in that we uh, talked about, we, we had a brief meeting before the school committee retreat um, talking about some of the calendars and the uh, scheduling and uh, of the various goals and evaluating the goals, which really led into the uh, discussion of the re retreat on the same topic. So uh, the uh, full committee is fully aware of where we went on that. Uh, we have minutes in the uh, Novus, mm -hmm. which showed us passing a resolution and rescinding it uh, in light of the conversation within yep. the, the retreat. Uh, and uh, that's our report. So do we want to discuss, though, the uh, proposed superintendent evaluation processes and procedures? Certainly. Uh, Mr. Thielman submitted it, and because it was, I, I didn't include it in our subcommittee report because it was really a, 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 a result of the full uh, uh, retreat, so that right. uh, if the chair who led that process would like to discuss it. I think it's totally appropriate. So, yeah, I think this is time it's appropriate to, to look at that document and, um, and discuss it, because we didn't actually have time to fully discuss it in our retreat. And so, 
Um, Mr. Hainer, is, is this I, about the documentary well, or about something else? Yes, it is. I, okay. I've been thinking about it. My understanding was the, the subcommittee and then the full committee talked about sending it to policy and policy making the updated so, changes for the timeline of mm -hmm. multi evaluation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, so mm -hmm. what I understand is that there are changes that policy needs to make, but there's also for next year okay. a suggestion of um, the superintendent's evaluation that we need to look at. So uh, there's you, a proposal on the table. You're talking about the, the timeline for the rest of this year. So so not, not necessarily timeline, but really we want to talk about the evidence required and the mm -hmm. Um, so the, and the professional, the goals, professional practice goals, the um, student learning goals, district improvement goals. Is this right, Mr. Thuman? Yeah. So in, yeah. In, in June, by policy, we're supposed to agree on the professional practice, student learning, and district improvement goal. But we had a debt exclusion, and people right. were busy, a bunch and of we could, could get to it. <laughs> so, um, and usually, you do that before the start of the fiscal year. So we're in the middle of the fiscal year. We're selecting them. Um, these, if you look on the document in Novus and you go to the first, the bottom of the first page and the second page, there's three, there's goals selected. There's a professional practice goal selected, which is um, complete the physical design of the Gibbs School and complete a written summary of the process by which the district will develop an academic, extracurricular, and socio-emotional program, including an academic schedule for the sixth grade. So it's mm -hmm. Design the school, uh, physical design in the school, and summarize the process by which we're going to mm -hmm. uh, program it. And then <clears throat> the student learning goal is written, refined vision, and program for Arlington High School, ready for submission to the MSBA. And the district improvement goal is a report on the completion of all documentation required in the eligibility period in the MSBA process for Arlington High School. So this is this is kind of our role mm -hmm. to approve this. And then the next thing is that our practice over the past couple of years has been to select three pieces of evidence for uh, the standards by which the superintendent is evaluated on policy CBI-E. And so there are suggestions there on pages two and three. In the preamble of the document, um, we lay out, or I lay out the <coughs> um, things the policies and procedures subcommittee might look at relevant to separating the, uh, the district goal setting process, the review of the district goals from the superintendent's goals. Mm -hmm. And that what we talked about at the retreat mm -hmm. was the policies and procedures subcommittee was going to state mm -hmm. in the policy that we would have a, a policy BAE would be amended to set up a specific date in the first part of the year, September or October mm -hmm. at the latest, in which the superintendent comes back and gives a report on the district goals. Because the mm -hmm. consensus of the group was that should be separate from the superintendent's mm -hmm. goals. Right. And so that's what we did. And then the other thing we talked about in that same policy was to amend CBI uh, to put in a date by which the superintendent submits her goals for the next year. Her proposed goals. Proposed mm -hmm. goals. For, right. And then and the school committee mm -hmm. yeah. um, reviews them and right. revises and them if necessary. And, yeah. Right. So that's all it is. So, so we, so, you know, it really should be, since we're asking for evidence for an evaluation of the superintendent, and we're identifying professional practice, student learning, and district improvement goals, they need approval by the full school committee. Mm -hmm. Right. One member can't come and say this is what we have to do. Mm -hmm. So... So and I and I when it's listed here as a first read because yep. people uh, even though people saw it's, it the retreat mm -hmm. it's right. a chance for people to read it and reflect on it and then vote on it at the meeting on February 9th. Great. Okay. So let's uh, commentary about um, what's what's listed here, Mr. Hainer. How do you want to take input? I think it should go to the chair of the subcommittee. <laughs> <laughs> so then I would ask, I would ask through the through our chair. Okay. When's the next CIA meeting? Okay, well, so I, I guess the question is, it, um, are people prepared mm -hmm. to discuss this document now, or do you feel that you'd prefer to give well, you know, what, writing? What, what about something, one way to do it is, there's a document here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a first read. The second read, people can come back with amendments. Yeah. That's all. Okay. You can just say, you're mm -hmm. going to amend it, and here's my proposal. So I know, open form. Fine. Yeah. I know I know. I have two suggestions that I'd like to see um, incorporated. Um, so, so this gets gets at what we care about, I think, and gets at what we've, um, you know, said we were doing this year, with two exceptions, I feel. And, and the first is that, um, that we have this big uh, grant to us for safe and supportive schools to look at social and emotional needs. 
and that um, a district goal of ours, I think, is to have sort of a clear plan forward. And and I, I, I and I may, maybe this is a little bit too early, and that's actually a question I have, but but the beginning of a plan, and so that's just not reflected yet. And the second thing that's not reflected that's very much in our district goals is um, uh, technology uh, use. I mean, we talked to, in the district goals um, was to give more professional development help to teachers to utilize technology, and um, and I know that's something that the district cares about very much. And so, mm -hmm. so it feels like maybe there should be some way to incorporate that in um, the evidence you know, of a district goal and, and, and some evidence that we're making progress. So you're, you're proposing is that we substitute the district goal district because you can only have one district improvement goal. So oh, you, you can only have one district. Yeah, so you want to get rid of one, you want to get rid of the high school thing. Um, okay, so I, I'm sorry, I, di I didn't mm -hmm. I didn't get that you only have one. Um, May I? Uh, yeah, no, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I, I'd have to. I, uh, I'm not sure about that. All Maybe right. I'll give that in writing to Mr. Schlickman. Yeah, Mr. Schlickman. I'd Sainer. like to go with what Mr. Thielman suggested, that we take these home, take a look at yeah, it, yeah. and mm. come back Absolutely. here and dedicate Those are just uh, my thoughts at the, the next time. meeting. No, no, okay. I, yeah. I appreciate yeah. that. So the, so the, the framework is this. The, uh, I think the, now I could have, the mm. policy is you got to select one professional, pra pro professional practice goal, one student learning right. goal, one district approval goal. Mm. So got it. people don't like those, mm. we, 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 you we know, you delete one and add another. Mm -hmm. And okay. then we, there's no policy that says this, so there's no restriction on this, but the, but, but the teachers present as three pieces of evidence mm -hmm. for each standard right. upon which they're evaluated. Mm -hmm. And Up so we, we applied that to, to, yep. to Kathy. Okay. Um, so under the evidences, <clears throat> if people, I mean, we don't have to do this. People can add 25 if you want. But the, you could, the one theory, one, one approach to this might be for every one we add, we should delete one. Okay. 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 Uh, so, do we have an idea of when curriculum is meeting next? No, we do not. Do, um, do you want? But, but I, or is there a time that you want the I feedback that, to? I suggest. Uh, what I would suggest is people send mm. suggestions to the chair. But mm. do you have a date that you want it? The and then, well, well, let me hear out Mr. Thielman's suggestion. Uh, this is my suggestion. My yeah. suggestion: everything goes to the chair. If if it's uh, if it's a lot of suggestions, then maybe he calls a meeting of the committee. If not, it just comes to the, to the floor at the next meeting as amendments. Okay. That's okay. All. I, I, so. I I would concur that we should have this as a whole committee, because, yeah. uh, and that uh, what I will do is I'll concatenate the any suggestions yeah. we have. I'll take Mr. Thielman's document, redline it with the uh, any suggestions, and uh, that's better. We, okay. we can vote okay. them. So okay. uh, the deadline would be a week from tomorrow. From next school committee. Yeah. So that uh, I can over the following weekend uh, merge the document, send it to Karen, so that, that uh, she can put it in Nova, so we know what. Uh, is before us and is sort of an unwritten rule because we can't make the rule but sort of respectfully ask folks that unless they submit something in writing is a proposed change to the document that they not bring it into the meeting mm -hmm. uh, Afterwards. Uh, after okay. after Friday. Okay. So if people have suggestions so you would come back with a red line version? Well, a red line version with, a, with, with every, every suggested, suggested amendment uh, yeah. Depending on how many uh, uh, suggestions we have, uh, will depend on how I organize the document. And I'll do that's that right. over next weekend and uh, yeah, uh, send it along, and we can uh, look at them and see what we want to do. Yeah. Sounds good. So I think you've got a, you got a lot, right. little time great. for that. Okay. Okay. This might be a 15-minute okay. conversation. Okay, me. great, great. We'll do that. Um, uh, facilities, Mr. Thielman. We have no report. No. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, policies and procedures. Mr. Uh, our next meeting is February 16th at 5.30 here in this room. We will continue to be working on policy regarding student activity fee. We will also be working on an updated timeline going forward uh, for the superintendent's evaluation and, go and goals. Okay. Uh, school enrollment task force, when is, do we have enough meeting date? Yes, it is uh, the... February 8th, 8th yes. 6 p.m. 6 o'clock here. And in the school committee room? Yep. Right here, okay. February 8th, 6 p.m. We're supposed to get a report on the Hardy, but it sounds like it's been resolved. But no, we, we're, I think it sounds like there's a report on common spaces, right? Expected then. We need a report on Hardy. Yeah. 
the whole everything in yeah. common spaces as well. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Spaces as well. Okay. But also, I, th I think we were also talking about having a, a rough draft of expenses. Maybe that's more, more long range planning for, for Gibbs. Mm -hmm. I think it's really hard to use mm. the school enrollment. It's yeah. long range yeah. planning. Yeah. Wants to have was the task. About Gibbs. We'll be right. here. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, warrant committee? Sign the check. Okay. Um, then we have a vote that we need to take on um, representation from the school committee for the Gibbs committee. Yes, and Mr. I Hanna. nominate Ms. Starks to represent okay. the school committee on that committee. I second. Okay, nominated by Mr. Hayner, Ms. Stark, seconded by Mr. Thielman. Any discussion? Uh, I just want to say I think that's an excellent choice. Um, <laughs> oh, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. Uh, I think about sixth grade. As a sixth grade teacher, she has a unique insight into it. She's um, you know, what's going on in the yeah. sixth grade world. Um, and I think that I think that'd be very helpful. Yeah. So cool. we just have to make sure the meeting times work for everybody. Um, but but your schedule is similar to it's teachers here, schedule. so exactly. that should be helpful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're gonna be after school. Yeah. Uh, deference to teacher schedules. Cool. Yeah. Very exciting. Okay, so um, you all voted. Uh, no, we haven't. No, voted. We haven't okay, yet. so all in favor, please say by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Okay, it's unanimous. Um, okay, so announce. Oh, liaison reports. Any liaison reports? Nobody been. Nobody went anywhere. <laughs> uh, well, I can t say I went to the stipend committee, uh, Mr. Spiegel, um, and um, because of our sort of dire budget situation unfortunately wasn't sort of a down meeting that there wasn't a lot of money left over to um, increase stipends um, stipends are given to teachers for doing work above and beyond what they're contracted to do um, and it they don't cover all the amazing things they do it's just sort of a honorarium thank you <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but yeah I would say we have a very very involved student body in our district at the middle school and high school and involved teachers at both the middle school and high school and some elementary as well who do a lot of uh, people are just interested in doing a lot of different clubs and different activities and st students bring ideas to the teachers and the teachers agree to um, advise them and a lot of that that starts as a volunteer basis and it ends up as a stipend but again i think our the interest of our students and our teachers kind of goes beyond what our budget can yeah. allow yeah. Um, a number of stipends come out of principal budgets. We're not touching principal right. budgets. Yeah. Budgets are, I, I think this is really what, what would be stipends we might put in the contract, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, it's just. Yeah, it was, yeah that was, it's what yeah. it would be. Yeah. 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 But I, I don't, a lot, uh, if, if, at the middle and the high school, there are a lot of project stipends that go on. Mm -hmm. Because our teachers are amazing, they just, mm -hmm. But if a student says they want to do a club and then get some other students, and it goes on for several years, and yeah. then the, right, and they do, a lot of things happen out of the goodness of their hearts because they love doing it. Mm -hmm. It's true. Mm -hmm. um, Announce uh, yeah, announcements, Mr. Hainer. On February fourth, I, with a couple of hundred other crazy Rotarians, will be indulging in a polar plunge at Cape Ann in Gloucester to raise money for polio vaccinations throughout the world. Um, I want to remind people. Oh, and I would like to thank <coughs> the members for their contribution as well. Great. Um, I want to remind people about the ACA's Winter Arts Gala. Um, as Dr. Barry mentioned before, it's a fundraiser. It's going to be held at Town Hall at 7 o'clock. Sorry, what was the name of uh, The ACA Arlington um, Center for the Arts um, Winter Ga Arts Gala, I believe it's called. It's 7 o'clock at um, Town Hall. Good day. Saturday. Oh, Saturday. Saturday. oh, sorry, Saturday the 28th, oh, yes, okay. yes, at 7 o'clock. Um, I also know that Battle of the Bands is going on at the same time, probably. Uh, some overlap, but some different crowd, younger crowd, um, that the high school, mm -hmm. which is, is, is benefiting. I just said something. <coughs> was, do you remember who is benefiting? I'm not or sure. <laughs> or, Laura, do you, have any, do you remember who is benefiting? It's a, it's, know, it's a charity. Okay, it's a charity event, I know. The Battle of the Bands? Dance Club. Um, I think it's against violence in Darfur. I want to say it's that club. There's a few of them. Okay. Yeah. I, it was reported in the paper, actually. So there was something, but, but it's a charity event, um, and I believe it's at the Regent. 
at 7 o'clock. Um, and uh, it's a bunch of different high school bands battling it out, raising money. Uh, other announcements? Okay. Uh, so we have um, Human Rights Commission we've already done, so uh, executive session. So we're going to go into executive session to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiation with union and or non-union personnel or contract negotiations with union and or non-union in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect. To conduct strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect. Collective bargaining may also be conducted. To discuss CFO compensation. To vote to approve the following executive session mis minutes, December 15th, 2016. Uh, so we need to vote so on- move. uh, So move. Move by Mr. Hayner. Second. Seconded by Mr. Slickman, and we need a roll call vote. Mr. Cardin. Yes. 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 And yes. Okay. Uh, we're not coming back from executive session. 